Welcome to the March 5th North Hudson City Council meeting. I am Jill Louise and I will be presiding this evening. Uh, first, I want to announce that we are being audio and video recorded. And we will start with a comment as we always do. Um, when you come to the podium, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has equal opportunity to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Um, if you're still talking at three minutes, I'll ask you to please finish your sentence and then give someone else a turn. Um, per our rules, we don't respond during public comments, so please direct your comments to us, but you'll understand when we do not respond to you. I'm going to start with the sign-up sheet, and then anyone who's not on the sheet who would like to speak will be given an opportunity. First up is Stephen Callahan. Hi, Stephen Callahan. I live at 824 Bruce Pitt Road in Hampton, Mass, and I've been sort of the opening act here for the last five or six meetings. Uh, I'm not happy to bring here, you know, the news that I bring every time, but I think it's something disturbing and something that the city needs to address. Number one is the violation of Massachusetts law that requires transparency that has city contracts recorded independently by the city clerk and available for the public for inspection. So they're, number one, they're recorded. It's not, I don't have to go and ask somebody from the planning department for records. I go to the city clerk, and they have dated it, they stamped it, and it's the official record of the city. The fact that it has not been available through the city clerk's office for three years and four or five months, I think, is upsetting. The whole purpose of the law is to provide transparency so the public can inspect what's going on. And when the public can't, I think that's sort of a, something would immediately raise my suspicion, okay? The second thing is that I've been unable to get records out of City Hall, and uh, for three months or more, I've been trying to get all records associated with the project in the city. I was sent three of them. I know there's at least two more. There might be more than that. I don't know. But I've been un unable to get them, and I don't even know at this point whether there's an official record that exists that's been stamped by somebody and verified that this was in place on such and such a date. But. So that's one thing. I'm sad to say that it appears that the council, or at least the president, the leadership, does not want to have this discussed in public. So to some extent, it's been allowed and accepted. And I know that that's a harsh thing to say. But if you have four weeks or a month to come up with an explanation about why you changed the way you did it and broke the law, and you couldn't come up with a good explanation in four months for why you did something that was against the law, then there's no good explanation. The next thing I want to bring up is I mentioned last month, the last week I was up here, that one of the lots that was sold, market value, it was said by the mayor these were going to be sold market value. The market value for these lots are $90,000 a piece based upon what somebody's paying in taxes exact same lot next door, $90,000 a piece. These lots were sold for net return to the city of about $65,000. So we're about out $250,000 and I think it would be outrageous is if after we in the city passed an override that any money should be used to cover a shortfall in terms of what looks like a very poor financial <coughs> transaction selling land for the city. If it's worth three sixty. dollars it's advertised at 200, and then we say, well, why don't we send $45,000 of the profits to some third party, never recorded in the books. I think that's outrageous as well. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I would just hope that the override money was not going to go to cover this kind of, and I'm going to say screw up, I'm sorry, inappropriate language, but selling something that's worth 360 and the city net $65,000, that's pretty serious. Okay. And the one thing I would also bring up at this point is, I know this is a difficult situation, but the f law and the facts fall on one side. And I know that everybody wants to give City Hall the benefit of the doubt, okay? And they want to preserve the executive people, make the decisions, try to run the city. But when the laws and the facts line up on one side, and the executive branch lines up on the other side. Just think of the problems that Republicans had a couple of months ago with uh, Mitch McConnell, okay, in terms of making decisions. No evidence, no witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Kat 
Uh, Bodziak? Yes, close enough. Bodziak. Bodziak? Welcome, Kat. I usually Kat. use uh, my, my, middle name, my middle name, Alonzo, when I'm, when I'm doing stuff in public because it's just so much easier for people to remember. <clears throat> I didn't have a lot to say today, like I did last time <laughs> with you. But I um, just wanted to first mention that the harm reduction group that, I, that I'm co-running was moved to Tuesdays, and I would re really appreciate people coming and to check it out and see what me and Albie are doing there. I did a radio program with Ruthie from the pedal people on Tuesday at 3 o'clock talking about what we're doing or trying to do. It's a fledgling group, but um, mostly it's just my homeless friends coming in and getting warm and saying hello to me and because there's no shelter and they're always full. So anyways, I just wanted to ask if you guys, um, you can just think about it. Just think about, I'm nervous. I don't know why I wasn't last night. <laughs> All the lights. If you guys participate in any sort of public outreach as a city council group, and if so, come check out the harm reduction group on Tuesday at six o'clock. And if not, look it up online. It's me and LB, but I would appreciate any feedback from public people because it's a public service. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. I hope it made some sense. Could you repeat the address? Oh, it's right over on Gleason Plaza. It's at the Recovery Center. Thank you. Was that enough? It's your time, however you want to use it. Oh, no, no, I meant like, is that enough information for Oh, me? sure. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak who was not signed up? <coughs> Seeing none, um, we will convene. Laura, will you take the roll call, please? Sure. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Bob. Here. Councilor Sierra. Here. Councilor Large. Present. Councilor Maori. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor Quinlan. Here. Councilor Shara. Here. Here. Okay. Um, we are all here and convened. Um, we will, unless committee, do any committee chairs have any updates or information they want to share? Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a continuation of the hearing uh, that was opened up at our last legislative matters meeting and it will be continued to, to discuss uh, non-conforming lots um, at our next meeting on the 9th and uh, the public's welcome to attend. The public has attended, uh, that was pretty well was pretty well attended last time. There are also a couple, it, we have a really beefy agenda. There are uh, other zoning changes that will be discussed that um, uh, would probably be of interest to the public and I urge you to check out the website at northamptonmod.gov, ma as in short for Massachusetts. And um, come and, uh, and you can read up on what we're going to be discussing and if it is of, of uh, concern to you, please, Come and speak to that effect at the hearing. Any other announcements or recognitions from counselors? Yeah, I just wanted to give a quick update from the City Services Committee meeting on Monday. Um, Northampton's health director uh, came to speak with us about um, the coronavirus. And I, I've been hearing out on neighborhood lift serves and kind of out in public, a lot of people have an awful lot of questions. Um, so she was able to talk to us and, and uh, I think it's important to note that information is updating kind of daily. Um, so the best sources of information are the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the CDC website. And she's working to get information out in the community as well. She did a question and answer at the Senior Center this morning. Um, and she's happy to schedule additional Q&As. I talked with her about it this morning and she suggested waiting a couple of weeks while more information is known. Um, we'll be working to get that information out. Thank you. Any other, yes, Councilor Jarrett. Uh, the Bay State Village Association is putting on uh, the Bay State Village Bash, which is the Sunday, March 15th from 12 to 2 p.m. at the Nonatuck Community School, which is at 221 Riverside Drive in Florence. Um, so it's a potluck, and it's a great way to meet neighbors in Bay State. Uh, there apparently will be Bay State Bingo <coughs> and Twister. Um, <clears throat> and um, they also put on a picnic at Mainsfield in the fall as well. Fun. That's Bay State Twister as well, or Bay State? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, any other announcements? Nope. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have any communications? Okay. So we have a resolution this evening. And actually, let me grab it at him. So this is 20.031. A resolution in support of the Empower Act. <clears throat> I'm going to read it, and then we'll have a motion on it, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Okay. So this is on uh, the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission, Councilor Michael Quinlan Jr., Councilor Alex Jarrett, and Councilor William H. Dwight. A resolution in support of the Empower Act. Be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Whereas in 2018, the Northampton City Council passed Resolution R 18.097 to petition the Massachusetts Legislature to allow the City of Northampton to establish a minimum voting age for residents of Northampton of 16 years for all municipal elections. Whereas the Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission, the Northampton City Council, the Mayor of Northampton, and the Northampton Charter Review Committee have unanimously supported the lowering of the voting age to 16. Whereas the Empower Act would permit 16 and 17 year olds to vote in municipal elections in those cities and towns whose legislative body has voted to accept it. Whereas lowering the voting age will create a more perfect democracy in our municipality by empowering young people to be involved in the local political system. Whereas the issues voted on at the municipal level such as school committee and municipal spending on climate change mitigation as well as, well as many others directly affect young people. Whereas the 16 and 17 year olds of Northampton have already shown their passion for civic engagement and electoral politics through organizing strikes, marches, and walkouts, and hosting elected officials and candidates for elected office at youth led forums. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the sponsors call upon the Northampton City Council to petition the Massachusetts Leg Legislature to pass Senate Bill 389 and House Bill 720 of the 191st session, quote, an act ensuring municipal participation of the widest eligible range end quote, otherwise known as the Empower Act. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the city council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to the state sponsors of the act. Uh, Senator Harriet L. Chandler and Representatives Andre um, X, uh, X. Vargas and Dylan A. Fernandez, chairs of the Joint Committee of, on Election Laws, Senator Barry R. Feingold and Representative John John J. Lawn, Jr., State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, State Senator Joe Comerford, House Speaker Robert DeLeo, Ho Senate President Karen Spilka, and Governor Charles Baker. Is there a... Uh, I'd like to move for approval, please. Second. Second. Motion's been <laughs> made and seconded. Um, discussion. Sponsors? I'd like to start with the sponsors. I defer to the two sponsors. The, the, these two gentlemen did the legwork. Legwork gentlemen. Councilor Jarrett, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so first I want to thank the uh, Youth Commission and especially uh, Noah Cassis for uh, <clears throat> their work in uh, helping and, you know, it, first of all, bringing this to our attention and helping us craft the resolution and um, <clears throat> just being uh, great advocates <clears throat> um, for themselves and for youth and for the whole city. Um, <clears throat> I kind of wanted to say a little, give a little story of um, my life at age 17. Uh, <clears throat> so I ended up graduating from high school just a few days after my 17th birthday <clears throat> and then spent most of my 17th year living uh, on my own in Albany, New York as a teaching intern at a school there. And um, <clears throat> it was quite an experience uh, to N to, to be totally on my own, to have to figure out, you know, my mom gave me this um, <clears throat> list of recipe cards and then I had to go shopping and just figure everything out. And I think that that experience, <clears throat> um, you know, somewhat ahead of schedule um, <clears throat> for many people, but it's, it's not, it, it shows that, you know, 16 and 17 year olds have the ability to engage in the world as adults do, and I think that they uh, should have the rights to participate in civic affairs uh, if they so choose. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's that's all I'll say for now. There's there's quite a bit in the original resolution that really lays out here it, here are some is some reasoning as to as to why, um, <clears throat> and this one is more about so let's support the state uh, to give us the option 
to then choose if, uh, as, a, as a municipality whether to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank Councilors Jarrett and Dwight for their partnership on this. Um, I was thrilled to join forces with you uh, on the first resolution presented to this council. Um, also, uh, I echo a big thank you to the Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission and their chairperson, Noah Cassis. Um, their preparation and enthusiasm are, are certainly inspiring. As some of you may know, my children were both members of the Youth Commission as well. My son, Patrick, a few years ago, joined uh, and caught the tail end of the effort to uh, put the plastic bag ban into effect here. Uh, and that was our first, as a family, exposure to the Youth Commission. We were pretty wowed by that group. And then uh, as the group kind of evolved over the next coming years, my son Tucker was a two-year member. And then last year was the co-chair, along with the formidable uh, Margot Shackett Green. Uh, their work on this initiative specifically has been inspiring. And I think my wife and I were pretty tough on Tucker when he was trying to figure out how to, how to advocate for this. And we really, you know, we're, we're just proud of him. You know, kids, they research and write papers and make presentations all the time, right? So getting into this for them was like really excellent because they chose it uh, and they wanted to be able to talk about this. So, um, you know, this is a little bit, inspiring on multiple levels. Their work inspired the previous council to pack the, pass the resolution that is referred to here and that Councilor Jarrett just spoke of. Uh, the mayor signed off on it with his inspiration. The Charter Review Committee was inspired to put it into their proposed changes to the charter. And so that's all great. Like Northampton is really behind this as a group and this is wonderful and the, the, the young people did a great job. But then in January you learn of the Empower Act. I learned of the Empower Act and I was like, whoa, this is like momentum. And here we are in a community that's taking a leadership role here, right? We're not the first, but we're one, among the first cities to, to go for this. And to me, that just said a lot about our city, right? Yeah. What the people here are about, what we are encouraging our young people to do. Uh, and so I felt really great about that. Um, you know, last but not least, I would just say I'm really proud that we're in early on this, and I asked my fellow counselors to join me in urging our state legislators to pass the Empower Act. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I submitted a letter and testimony um, about four weeks ago when, when the committee was originally meeting and it's, I'll just read what I said. It's, I'm asking you to consider S389, an act ensuring municipal participation in the wi widest as opposed to wildest uh, eligible range favorably and that you allow it to move forward for timely approval. In recent years, we've witnessed multiple demonstrations of urgent political engagement by teenagers. They're expressing their desire to participate in the decision-making process that determines their futures. The issues are not inconsequential, climate change, gun violence, racism, and bias and social inequity, among others. Today's youth activism reveals a sophistication that's unknown before. They have access to data and analysis that were not available to most of us when we, who are of majority age, were teens. And they use that access to organize and deliberate and critically analyze the world at large. They just can't vote. We're also experiencing a crisis of diminishing voter engagement that is a result of calculated suppression and burgeoning cynicism and apathy. We now have an opportunity to cultivate civic participation by promoting suffrage to citizens at an early age and allowing them to vote their com in their communities and participate in their own local governance. We in Northampton have been discussing the possibility of expanding municipal voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds for three years at the initiative of our youth commission. To date, the city council has unanimously supported a resolution endorsing the efforts to that end. And we have also included a proposed charter amendment that calling for enfranchising our young adults. The notion enjoys broad support in the community across the political spectrum um, and among all age groups. And I believe that we should take every opportunity to expand enfranchisement wherever possible. We subscribe to the ideals of democracy, but we do not always demonstrate it. In this instance, we have a cohort that is asking to be vested with the right to vote, who have urgent concerns and who want to say in how they are governed. That expressed desire should be the most compelling argument to consider the Empower Act positively. Thank you for your consideration and your attention to my testimony. As, as, <coughs> as Councilor Quintland pointed out, 
His sons, of course, have transitioned into the age of qualified voters in the course of, and they understood that this was going to be a long process and that it was not going to benefit them directly yet. They and their cohort among them in the three previous youth commissions all worked very hard to see this realized. There's a level of activism and participation and expressed desire to be enfranchised that you can't find an equivalent anywhere in the community. Um, you know, I, we get some pushback. We just had some pushback, in fact, uh, at the Charter Review presentation, I'm basically saying they don't own property. They don't, um, you know, they don't make enough money. And that's disturbing to hear because actually yeah, about 150 years ago, we didn't make, we eliminated that criteria of one, having to be a property owner and two, having to be, ha having to be wealthy, a wealthy property owner. I mean, once upon a time, that's true. One man, one vote literally meant one man vested with property and that included other human beings could vote, nobody else. And we don't do that anymore. The arguments against this have been the exact same arguments you heard um, when the discussion of offering African Americans the opportunity to vote, or women, that they're not enfranchised by wealth, they do not, uh, they don't have the sophistication, they will vote the way their, their boss votes or their parents vote and this is this is deeply cynical at a time when we have the manifestations of elections that prove the opposite you don't obviously have to be very intelligent to vote because i would hold i would offer as testimony and, and actually as exhibit a the president of the united states was voted in as president of the united states and I don't think that was a product of very sophisticated, critical, political analysis. And it's, you don't have to be good looking, you don't have to be wealthy. All you have to do is want to be part of the, the community that governs you and how your community is governed. We have a cohort in this community asking for that. And simple request is our obligation to honor, I think. And I hope that the state, with this uh, reinforcing resolution, will be also so moved to actually recognize that this is this is appropriate. And I think I, uh, the Gazette just had an article today. A number of the Western Mass delegation uh, uh, representatives in Senate, Senate as uh, Senator Comerford, have all spoken in favor of support of the Empower Act and offering these rights to citizens of 16 and 17 year old uh, of 17 across the state these opportunities should their community feel that they're entitled to it. And one last thing, I, when I went on uh, WGBY with uh, Margot Shaka Green at the time I was the chair, the, the interviewer asked her, why should teenagers have the privilege to vote? And, and Margot was a little taken aback and I said, well, excuse me, let me interrupt. So I, felt the opportunity to mansplain shouldn't be passed up. And I, and it's not a privilege. It's a right. A privilege is a driver's license. That's You earn that. You have to pass all sorts of criteria. That's a privilege. This is a right. No one has to earn a right. You're vested with a right. So um, that was my slam dunk and that was my mic drop moment. Of course, we still had to talk for another seven or eight minutes, so that was awkward. But <laughs> anyway, I'm very grateful to Councilor Quinlan and Councilor Jarrett because honestly, they did the bulk of the work in conjunction with Noah Cassis and, and their, the rest of the Youth Commission is deeply vested in this. So I, I hope, I, I, I'm pretty confident I know how this vote's gonna shake out, but I'm, I'm going to say thank you in advance. Councillor LaBarge. Yes, um, this is for Councillor Dwight. We did this, what, three years ago? Out of resolution, two and a half years ago. Right. Now we're going into the Empower Act, and I agree with it 100%. My question is, how long will this take? The Empower Act? 
Uh, we're talking about the Massachusetts legislature. It's in committee. This is what I'm saying. I, I, Why are we not looking at doing a home rule? We are. And you'll, in fact, you'll, we'll be addressing that issue later on. We're, we're doing a multi-flank attack on this. Um, we're going to ask the state to grant us permission. We would be unique in that respect. There's no other community that's been granted that, in, uh, despite a number of appeals. And we're also asking, but ideally, if the Empower Act is signed by the governor, is passed and signed by the governor, then the, our, our requests become moot. We wouldn't have to ask that. But we're covering all our bases. I just have, I wrote something up quickly. And I put down, I think it was like five de decades ago, the voting age was dropped from 21 to 18, which is quite a while. Now there are some later legislators who feel, and many residents who have spoken at meetings in our city, to lower the age from 16 to 17 years old. And even at um, Jackson Street School, we heard many, many people asking to lower the age. And to me, in my heart, I think they should have a right to do that. And I agree everything, Councilor Dwight, what, what you were saying about that right for them to be able to vote. I do believe we should have young people at the age to be able to engage in our democracy. I just wish in my early years I had this opportunity also. I feel it is important to involve, in, involve as many people who are excited and invested in the democratic process especially in municipal elections. We all need to take a good look. Times have changed. We have a new generation of young people who are very excited in the government process. We have young students in our high school and we were all there marching with them. And I am proud for every high school student who became activists in this city. So I believe of them out there on gun violence, which we have brought up before, and for um, climate change, is showing us a change in the democracy where young people are involved. And I feel at the age of changing the voting for them, I feel I will support this 100%, and I, whatever I have to do, if I have to march with whatever, to make this move, because to me it's valuable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nash. Yeah, um, I'll be 100% supporting this and that, um, you know, I just want to say that over the years, the, the work that's been presented to council during my time on council, from the Youth Commission, it's all been really wonderful. And it comes to us uh, well, well prepared. Uh, they make wonderful arguments for, you know, why we should take whatever action that they're asking for. Uh, they, they, they've, uh, you know, I, they did something on the stormwater fee many they, they years were, ago. Yeah. It was a great, you know, they, they've done, you know, that people in this age group have done some of the best work for our city over the you know during the time we've had the youth commission and um and i i think we owe it to them uh tonight to um you know i, I will be voting yes for this i also want to do a shout out to um councillor dwight for his mentorship with these young people over the years that the that they when when they come to us and they are um confident and well informed and um uh that that counselor dwight work behind the scenes has 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 been um essential for that to happen and um that um that that the youth you know he that they they have been uh, really glowing but um counselor dwight's work has has not gone unnoticed thank you here Councilor Mary. Yeah, I just really wanted to add that, uh, well, first of all, to thank um, all of you for putting this forward, the Youth <coughs> Commission, the Charter Review uh, Committee. I I'm, I'm feel proud to be part of the city while this is going on. I've worked uh, with a lot of the, of the folks from the Youth Commission as a community organizer. I was in 
quite impressed, as you were saying, Jim. Um, and I, I think, I think we all here know the power of municipal government or we wouldn't be here and the importance of it. I was um, very politically minded at 16 and 17, but um, really kind of didn't feel invested or engaged in my, um, my immediate community because uh, there was no place for my voice that time there. I went on to, to do um, uh, political activism in bigger ways and in other places. But I think it's really important and frankly we would really would love and need young people to um, start investing in Northampton and settling here or if they go back remembering that they felt invested and heard here and then returning. So I think this is a forward uh, thinking path and uh, I think it will bring good things and I don't think there's anything here to be afraid of. This is democracy, and this is the path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor, oh, uh, do you I, have a response? I, I actually, as a response to Council LaBarge's question, I just got some information here about um, where uh, the Empower Act sits. And oddly enough, on the 24th of February, um, there was an action that to not pass, uh, this is under Joint Rule 10, which I'm not sure what it is, and then the rules were suspended and then it was recommitted to the Committee on Election Law. So I'm not, we, uh, Sam Hopper's investigating this for me, but it's, I'm trying to figure out, <laughs> it seems very weird that it was, it was rejected same day it was the rules were suspended and recommitted <coughs> to the committee so that's where it sits so this actually this resolution actually has by that has, in, has gained even greater potential because the uh, clearly this is there are divided opinions on this and it's in jeopardy and anything that we can do to reinforce that our our commitment to this can't hurt so thank you yeah, first I'd like to start by thanking the co-sponsors for bringing this forward. Um, most of you have seen that I have two adorable little boys. Um, and most of you know that I had moved away from Northampton actually for about 10 years. And when my older boy was getting closer and closer to kindergarten age, it was really a decision where we were living in a lovely community, but it never quite felt like home in thinking about where do we really want to raise our children um, and the values we hold dear the way that Northampton makes space for youth leadership and the way that um, voices of a disparate group, disparate groups of people are honored and listened to. Um, you know, we, we really wanted to raise our children in Northampton. And not too long after moving back, um, as the March for Our Lives was being planned, I worked with a friend to plan a series of activities, for we called them the littlest marchers, but preschoolers and very young children who would not have been appropriate to be at the main demonstration. And the, the students who were leading that totally welcomed us in. I'm not sure if they 100% got why we didn't want our three, four, five-year-olds listening to the main speakers, but they totally welcomed us in, um, made space for the littlest marchers. At the back, we plan planned a series of activities at Pulaski Park. And through that process, I had the opportunity to witness up close the planning and the hard work and the incredible leadership and engagement of the youth. And um, being at the March for Our Lives in Northampton and seeing not just the work of the high school students, but how the community showed up and, in, I mean, in droves. Um, and the community supported their work. And the community came when the youth planned the Green New Deal Forum. And that space for leadership, um, you know, I think it, is something special. And the, the sophistication and knowledge and drive of youth to take on this activism, um, you know, I, I think needs to be recognized and rewarded. And it makes sense to me that in addition to sort of advocating and pushing from the outside, we should be welcoming them into the process um, on the inside as well. And so we all know that once you start voting, it becomes a habit. And, um, you know, in, in, in franchising 16-year-olds and helping to build that habit and that knowledge, um, hopefully they'll carry that with them um, for the rest of their lives. I think it's very powerful and uh, fully support this. Thank you. Any other counselors who wish to speak? 
Um, I will just add my thanks to the sponsors and for um, for bolstering the 2018 resolution that we passed. Um, I think I've I've probably told all of you. I'm sure I've told all of you my very strong feelings about uh, the use of resolutions and how I believe that they are a really important tool that we have to um, for us as a body to use our voice. And I think that this is, you know, I, I, in different ways, and this is one of the ways that I think it's really powerful to uh, send a message to the state legislature and say that our, we as representatives of our community believe this and would like you to act. So I thank you very much for, for bringing this to us. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, for a roll call, please. Um, Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Jen. Yes. Councilor Thor. Yes. That passes in first reading. So, next we move to the consent agenda. We take one reading on the consent agenda. Um, I will read the items through, then I'll ask if there are any removals for discussion. We don't discuss the consent agenda unless an item's been removed from it. Um, so first are the minutes of February 20th, 2020. And next we have the appointments, uh, appointment to the Council on Aging um, for Aria Ad Aji Domini Dominic. Um, she is, this is for, she's at 18 Con Street, Northampton, term 2020 to June 2023, February 2020 to June 2023. This is to fill a vacancy. Um, her uh, appointment re received a positive recommendation from City Services on March 2nd. Um, and then we have the appointment um, of Assistant Chief John Davin as Fire Chief. This also received a positive recommendation from City Services on March 2nd um, and so those are the three items that we have on the consent agenda. I would, Any I would move approval uh, but I would ask to remove um, the appointment of John Davin. Yes. Okay. Any other removals? So all those, in uh, you moved approval with that removal. Yes. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Seconded. Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent to those two items on the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Objections? Sentence? Okay. I'd like um, to move approval of the appointment of Assistant Chief John Davin as Fire Chief. Second it. That's been made and seconded. Discussion on the appointment. Okay. The reason I asked to have this removed is because uh, this is a significant transition. We acknowledge uh, the retirement of Dwayne Nichols. Um, you know, I think this is the first time in 50 years, I think close to 50 years that there hasn't been a Nichols family member serving in some um, safety capacity here for the city. <clears throat> and once again, my deep and heartfelt gratitude for their, all their good and thoughtful and very temperate work. Uh, I wanted to speak to John Davin because uh, he deserves at least even, uh, a, a couple of nods for his very good work. Um, I actually, my first experience with him was when in, in emergency services, he was the head of HAZMAT. And John has worked, again, he has a demeanor very similar to Dwayne Nichols, which is a quiet, thoughtful, deliberative process that actually accomplishes a great deal. And he is actually, to my understanding, he is well thought of by all the rank and file. And he is uniquely and distinctly qualified for the position. And I think that it's appropriate that that be acknowledged rather than just kind of fobbed off in a, in a consent agenda. And I, so I, I felt that needed saying. I appreciate you saying it. Any other discussion? Yes. Um, and can folks from city services also, you know, any other comments that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested because I wasn't there. I wasn't there either. Okay. But Someone who was there. Well, you, it, it was said, he was sent forward with a positive recommendation. Yes. So. You're conferring down uh, there. Okay. <laughs> I, I would tell you when, when he came in, we had, we had a chat because he's also, uh, 
you know, also still a, a major part of the emergency response team. So we participated in our discussion on coronavirus preparation here and then stayed after to, to discuss his uh, appointment. Um, you know, as he spoke about the department uh, and talked about their work and who they are and how they do what they do, this incredible sense of pride just was coming out of him. And he kind of mentioned at the end that he's very proud of the department. He's very proud of being part of the team there and, and really excited and proud to be the next leader of it. Uh, and it just showed the entire time he was speaking. I, I, I just, it was, it was pretty terrific. Thank you. Any other, oh, sorry, Councilor DeWight. Thank you. I'm Councilor DeWight and I, I know I've known him for 20 years and you're probably what about pretty close to yeah. me. Yeah. And um, I think we ne really need to look at the educational part with him. Very educated. Um, I think he's come a long way in that department. He's worked his way. And I'm going to support this promotion 100%. I know him. I know what he can do. And I think he's going to make a good leader. Yes. Uh, just a question to the mayor. We, we categorize him as fire chief, but he, the name of the department is fire and rescue. Do we, does that title still make sense, or at some point do we adjust that to a... I call it the chief fire. Chief works too, but yes, yeah, okay, all right. So this will be official. Any other comments? Um, would your preference be a roll call for this appointment? Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. roll call please. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor J.R.I. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, Assistant Chief John Davin is now Fire Chief. Well, we have. It will be on March 3rd. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we have approved. Uh, <coughs> his That's Chief Nichols' last day. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So moving on, we are going to have open up a deliberation and conversation on how we are going to address the charter review recommendations. This is a little bit of an unchartered path. Get, see what I did there? That's good. That's um, just right off the top of my head, I got that one. Um, so we're going to have kind of a discussion on how we're going to proceed. Um, it's not, it. we kind of get to decide how we proceed with some limitations. So um, I will tell you that so I've been advised by the solicitor that we uh, should be voting on each individual recommendation. So we're not going to take the report as a group and vote on the report. What we're going to do is vote on each recommendation individually. And, um, and additionally, some of the recommendations you'll see they um, in the annotated charter that we were given, the sort of change in language is in there. Some of them are the language needs to be crafted. And then the order that would go to legislature would need to be crafted. So it's a bit of a process that we're going to have to participate in and it'll be in conjunction with the mayor because both branches need to agree on this language that's going to go forward to the legislature. So um, I thought we should start this process which could be, could take us a bit of time. Um, and I am very happy to see we actually have five members from the Charter Review Committee, six counting Councillor Dwight that are here this evening. Um, so we would love to have you participate in a conversation with us about this and, and talk about how we're going to handle all of, all of your recommendations. Uh, can I make a motion Please. then that <coughs> former members of the Charter Commission, we have Molly Fox, Bob Baldreis, Dylan Gaffney, S Sam Hopper and Stan Moulton be recognized for purposes of discussion. So that's a motion to recognize them. Second. Second. It's been seconded. All those in favor of recognizing those five uh, members of that committee, please say aye. 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 They are duly recognized. Um, so, 
Counselor Dwight, since you were on, <laughs> um, do you want to help us walk through? So I should say that Laura was very helpful. She, as always, um, created a little sort of cheat sheet for us that kind of goes through the changes. So some of these changes, as I said, are already in, they're sort of more housekeeping. And we could start to address those. It's the ones where the language needs to be crafted that we need to figure out how we're going to go about. To that end, um, and the mayor, mayor and I have had some conversations about this. But as you said, this is this is kind of new territory for us. Um, when we did when we did the new charter, actually the structure at the time, the structure of the governance was different. The government was different in how we did this process here in council. So this is brand new. Um, he, the mayor has pointed out that the law. This is not something that we pass on to the mayor. The mayor has review, and then it, it's subject to veto, and then consequently subject to our override, and la di da di da. It, bas it basically means it, the order is essentially that there is agreement, there is consensus uh, with the council and the mayor. So in that case, the mayor will also be participating in this, and and I would assume and hope he has some recommendations. It doesn't leave us dangling here uh, by ourselves. So. I also would recommend that this is a large, no, the process took a year, um, and it could have taken longer, actually, probably, but it took a year and uh, lots of deep diving to generate the recommendations that are here. Um, I think it's appropriate for us to break this into at least two. Uh, for this meeting and then possibly the second half for another meeting, um, just because We'll die of old age before we get to vote on the, the final wording of the, of the final document. And, and without any objections, that would be my recommendation that we go in, uh, to a reasonable point. And my uh, also suggestion is to start with easy stuff. We'll kind of, we'll, instead of ripping the Band-Aid off, we're just going to slowly ease it off, as it were. Or let's, no, it's more like <laughs> diving into, instead of diving into cold water, we're going to wade into cold water until we get to the screaming point. Yeah, boiling frog. Yeah, OK. You're talking to people who plunged into water. So. <laughs> sure, we plunged. Right, right. To the ice uh, But I think um, <laughs> the reason for starting on the small parts also gets us we can get a rhythm, we can also get a sense of, of what it is that we're dealing with. Um, yeah, and then hopefully when the process is concluded that we will have, um, we will have a, essentially a memo that we'll send on to the uh, solicitor who will draft it in a final order form that we will vote on. Um, just so we can put our imprimatur on it and, and hopefully with the mayor's conclusion, so. So. Let's start. So should we start? So you're suggesting that maybe we, we start at the beginning and start with it. Laura's. Start this is start. actually Laura's cheat sheet is perfect. Yeah. So, um, yeah. before we start, first of all, Mr. Mayor, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to add to this process or anything you'd like to say about how we're going to go about this? No. Okay. Okay. Um, and any of the five members that are here, is there? Anything you would like to weigh in on before we? No? OK. Then we're just going to start. OK. So everyone has, uh, Laura made color copies, which are really helpful because we can see the changes. Um, so the first section that is recommended for amendment is section 2.2. Two dash two. two, dash two. B. What? Under B. Two B. Powers and B. Oh. Okay. So actually, the first thing is on the first page, recommending the city council remove attachment one from the charter. Um, it, it, uh, so, uh, Stan and Sam, attachment one, was that the letter to the mayor? We're referring to the, no. no. What is attachment one that we're talking about excising here? So um, what happened when we um, 
Yeah. So, <laughs> because, probably, uh, because we because we were essentially superseding a series of other laws, um, but we also there was a transitional period. So the the original special act said that all those laws stay into a, into effect until oh. such time that they're superseded. And so meaning when the council did its ordinances over, when I did my administrative code over, um, and so, because otherwise you you would have like, they would have vanished and then there would be no limbo. operating authority for some of these things because it hadn't been established. So there was this attachment of all these related laws that created the Board of Public Works, that created, you know, all the, <coughs> all the MGLs that sort of had been cobbled together um, and so the idea was that you would eventually those would all be superseded once the charter was fully in effect so having this attachment of related laws is now kind of moot um, because we've gone so through that transitional problem. process so that's why the city solicitor is recommending we no longer need that reference because they've been they've already been taken care of yeah so do you think we should just take a, should we make a motion on these as we go? Well, or how about straw polls because, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think straw polls which are, are not, they're not binding, but at least so we can know whether to move forward or not might be the way to go. Okay, but then when will we, then we'll vote on them? Then, the then that would be our recommendation okay. that we forward to the solicitor based on straw mm -hmm. polls. Except, am I correct that we we could vote on some of these, right? Mm -hmm. We, mm -hmm. it's just this. What hasn't been crafted yet is what needs to go to the solicitor. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Is is that not your understanding? Well, no, it's, I, no, you're presuming an understanding. I don't have one, but uh, <laughs> can we come to an agreed one? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. It's so hard. <laughs> what you were referring to is the fact that, like the this document has actual verbiage changes to the charter. Right. Whereas there are some recommendations that just say lower the voting age to 16, and so there's not actual language. Right. Okay. So that would be the kind of thing that if you wanted to do that and you wanted to incorporate the char charter, if you said that and you voted affirmatively, then the city solicitor would would put that into actual. Legislative language, so okay. that would so that would need to come back to you for a vote. Then the um, motion would be um, to that's an easy one. Take the language attachment a. Yes. Wait a minute. It would be to we worked this out, Laura. How are we going to uh, to 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 recommend uh, the amendment and excising of attachment a. Since we don't, we can't conclusively say one way or the other. Well, my thought was that you would, that this entire document uh, that were all the technical changes right, the that you agreed, uh, that you agreed oh, on. Right. I'm okay. not, I don't mean just that one. I'm talking about all the other technical changes, right. like the elect special election and the, the absence of the mayor the, yeah. and the vacancy of the mayor, all those that had the dates that had to be corrected, that those could all be taken as a package. Except because I think there may be a request for a removal of one or two of them That's for fine. further discussion. So. That's what I meant. Like okay. You could go through them and approve those as your first pass. And then well, my, my question is, I mean, essentially, normally what we would do is we say we would like to amend this. Uh, that we would vote to amend something and thus it is amended. But in this case, we're recommending an amendment because the final decision is to, uh, with the legislature. I mean, that's... I mean, that I, I just want to be clear on the language of the law, because if this were our document and that our fi we have the final say, we would say we amend this. We would like to amend this, and we vote on the amendment. In this case, I would say I'm adding the word recommending the removal of attachment A. It is our recommendation that the uh, charter be amended by removing document A. Do you understand the decision totally understand. I'm trying to make? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's what my motion is. Okay, that motion's been made. Seconded? Seconded. Excellent. Okay, any further discussion on that motion? Okay. Can you repeat it again? Yes. It's, 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 it's <laughs> the language with the, maybe a, And so are we, And but do we want to do these one by one like this or should we do it? I think the, the first one's always the hardest. Okay. So, yes. 
I think we should do the rest, of all of the other items like this. But do you want me? To, do you want me to? Oh you yeah. Do, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so <laughs> the uh, this is a recommendation from the council to amend the charter by removing attachment A, which included. Yes, you don't actually have attachment A there. It's in the. It's going to say. It is in the charter. Attachment A, as the mayor described it, is the, the the rules under the existing charter before we assumed the new charter. Does that, that make any sense? In order to actually have a fu functioning government that could vote on the final charter. No, we're losing. Yeah. It's attachment one, not attachment A, right? Yeah, sorry, yes. He's calling attachment A. I'm sorry, you're right. Attachment one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it does now. Thank okay. you. Laura, do you have that? Do, okay. Okay. This is well done. So, clarifying, are we kind of almost reversing the roles of legislative matters and the council by recommending two, two legislative matters as opposed well, no, to actually, no? No, actually, this recommendation okay. would go. This is the recommendation that provided there was concurrence from the mayor, and I'm presuming there is, uh, that would go to the legislature in the, the final order. State. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. By legislative. Thank okay. You. Yes. So, it's ahead. almost like we're being legislative matters here, getting into the technical. Yes. Language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. That was a good okay. answer. Okay. Any other discussion on that motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Objections. Okay. And, and Your Honor, I presume dissent on your part. Yes, most definitely. Okay. okay. All right. right. Attachment I, one. Taking yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to be clear. Like I had an appointment on the committee, and obviously the city solicitor was involved. So I've been very closely involved with this. Yeah. So. Right. No. No. I just. I. I, I I think we need affirmation yes. from your. We're gonna <laughs> we need a lot of affirmation. Go for concurrence. We yep. need your affirmation said out loud. So. Okay, uh, moving. So we're moving on to Article Two, Legislative Branch. That's us. Um, section two dash two, President and Vice President Election Term Powers. So uh, we're in B. Powers and duties. The president shall prepare the agenda for city council meetings, and then what uh, has been um, s stricken struck, in consult is in consultation with the mayor and the city clerk. So that is being removed. I would move. What I would recommend. Uh, I Do would. Do you not have that? No, I think it's here. Just oh, there's no page numbers. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Two dash two. Two dash two. Okay. I went too far. I move that the council recommend that we excise the line consultation with the mayor and the city clerk. Second. That has been now, for purposes of discussion, I think it's appropriate to have um, members of the Charter Review <coughs> explain why that. And actually, Sam, do you want to do that? Because, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, bought, I deserve you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just to give some clarification as to why that we're removing that. Do you recall? Because it wasn't actually Your Honor, right. do you remember? Well, that, was, that was that the request was the, from your office. It was office. the past practice before we separated the two branches of government, and so the city clerk, I think it was, I think, uh, the city clerk language was definitely boilerplate because in many cities the city clerk um, is the is the record keeper and the agenda maker of the city council, but we don't have that process. So I think it was sort of a boilerplate um, that slipped by us, and um, and the mayor used to make the agendas and be involved in it, um, but it no longer does. So I think it's just recognizing that the mayor and city clerk no longer play a role in the council affairs. Yeah. Okay. So it's just pra current practice. Right. Yeah, bringing the charter up to current practice. Any other discussion or comments? 2-2, two two, Councilor Nash? I think it's a good idea. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Any Anyone else from the committee who have thoughts on it? No? No? Okay. All those in favor of... Aye. All those in favor of recommending... What? The oh. Recommending the deletion. Right, all those in favor of recommending the deletion, please say aye. 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 Objections, sentence. Okay. So we're rolling. We are. Yeah. Moving right on to section two dash six, um, which is exercise of powers quorum rules, and then we're looking at C, 
um, C, and then first I, uh, which is the regular meetings of the city council shall be held at a time and place fixed by, and then deleting ordinance and changing it to order. And uh, I move that we recommend the, uh, the change. Second. Ordinance to order. Second. There was a second by Council mm -hmm. Large. This is actually the appropriate nomenclature. It's the right way. The term order instead of ordinance, and this is another oversight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor of recommending this change, please say aye. 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 Objections? Sentence? Okay. Now we are on to we've moved to section i mean we've moved to article three the executive branch uh this is three dash three appointments by the mayor um okay the mayor shall appoint subject to review by the city council under section 2-10 all city officers and department heads and the members of multiple member bodies for whom no other method of appointment or selection is provided by the charter provided however this shall not include persons serving under the school committee now this is what's being added comma persons serving under the superintendents of smith agricultural school and then continuing to what was already there and persons serving under the city council so it's adding those that are serving under the superintendents of the Smith Agricultural School to appointments by the mayor. I move that we, the council, recommend this addition. Second. It's been made and seconded. This was obviously an oversight that needed correcting. You see that comes up a couple of times how we make, we, uh, and, if, and in fact, practically everyone was here at Legislative Matters for the presentation by the. Uh, Committee, but as Sam Hopper pointed out, that um, Northampton is unique in the state because we have two school districts within our boundaries, uh, and we this the, you'll see a number of other changes that acknowledge the fact that Smith uh, Smith Vocational and Agricultural School are is a separate school district and as entitled to and also should be as constrained by the charter as any other school committee member that we are currently acknowledge. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of recommending that addition, please say aye. 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 Objections? Okay. Moving to section 3-6, approval of mayor veto. Every order, ordinance, and resolution um, is being uh, it was struck or vote adopted or passed by the city council relative to the affairs of the city, except memorial has been taken out or been changed to non-binding re resolutions. <clears throat> the selection has been um, eliminated and confirmation of city officers by the city council in any matters relating to the internal affairs of the city council shall be presented to the mayor for approval within three business days of such adoption or passage so um i i recommend the the council uh, the i i move <coughs> the council recommend the deletion of the term resolution the deletion of the term memorial and adding non-binding and the deletion of selection and replacing that with confirmation Okay. Second. That's made and seconded. This again is language. Actually, some of it's um, vestigial from the old uh, way that we consider the separation of powers. Uh, for instance, we do not select um, appointments now. I mean, and that so that once upon a time there were a few. We would. We once did the tax. Uh, we did the assessor. We did the uh, uh, treasurer. We did uh, any number of other appointments. That's no longer the case. And so um, that I'm going backwards here. The mayor doesn't have the authority to veto a resolution because it's essentially an expression of the will of the council. It's not non-binding. Doesn't carry the weight of law. And. Uh, it is, as we've said, it is, it, they're usually aspirational statements of this body. So the mayor can't say, no, that can't happen. So that would, that would be wrong. Um, 
and and I'm not sure the deletion of memorial the term memorial and non-binding maybe your honor you could speak I, to I think that. it was just to, to to recognize what we call it like a memorial that's true yes. so a lot of this was boilerplate right it was and but it didn't really fit with what our nomenclature here locally so I think it was just to bring it in line with our nomenclature mm -hmm. um, I think you know memorial may have been for like you know in honor of somebody retiring right. from the post office but obviously we do a lot of other non-binding resolutions that aren't just memorial so I think the idea was to use a broader term that encompassed the types of resolutions that you do, mm -hmm. i.e. the one you did earlier, right. which was exactly. not a memorial resolution. No. Yeah. Oh, uh, Councilor Jarrett. Um, the, we all have copies of this, but um, I know the audience doesn't is not seeing this as we move along. That's wonder, true. Is it possible um, to thank you? It would be possible to show that. that. Um, Councilor Nash. So I think on line nine, we go back to there's a resolution that also needs to be edited out. Um, line nine. If the city In council, this notwithstanding such disapproval by the mayor, shall again pass the order ordinance resolution. Mm. So I think that's another deletion, correct? Uh, good pass. Yes, my first yes, one. Yes, so mm -hmm. Well done. <laughs> Do you want to? Uh, no, I'll just do a friendly amendment. Okay. Any other comments on this section? No? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, recommending the deletion and additions in this section. Please say aye. 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 Objections? Okay. So, moving right down to the next section, which is 3-7, temporary absence of the mayor. So, um, this is what's being being deleted so a acting mayor and what's being deleted is whenever by reason of sickness absence from the city or other cause the mayor is unable to perform the duties of the office the president of the city council shall be the acting mayor city council by the affirmative vote of seven members shall determine whether the mayor is unable to perform the duties of the office notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary the vote shall be taken in public session by a roll call vote so that is being deleted and this is being added the mayor shall, by a letter filed with the city council and a copy filed with the city clerk, delegate authority pursuant to section 3-8 to a qualified city officer or employee to exercise the powers and perform the duties of the office during the temporary absence of the mayor for periods, for periods of 10 business days or less and to serve only when the needs of the city require and only to the extent necessary under the then circumstances. If the temporary absence of the mayor exceeds 10 business days, the president of the city council shall be the acting mayor. If at any time the city council determines that the mayor is incapacitated and unable to perform the duties of the office, it may appoint its, to, its president to serve as acting mayor by the affirmative vote of seven members. Notwithstanding any general or special law, to the contrary, the vote shall be taken in public session by a roll call vote. I uh, move to recommend the deletion, the recommend the the <coughs> recommendation recommended recommended deletions and then to add the language that they recommend how's that rather than recite it also does that make sense excellent second second it and seconded so this one needs a meteor discussion your honor I can actually speak to it because I'm the one who recommended it. Um, and this is actually more in line with what our practice has been um, because um, the way the, the way the, um, the way the old one was written, you had to sort of know I was out of the city somehow and, and, um, and then, then call a meeting and take a vote. And the way in practice that it worked out is that if I was going to be going away for an extended period of time, I would come to the city council and say, I think you ought to invoke this during that two week period of X, Y, and Z when I'm gonna be away. Um, and then you'd have to take a vote to do it. Um, and so 
Um, it still gives you the ability, if the mayor becomes incapacitated, to take emergency action. So we sort of separated that out. Um, but then it just it just uses the normal <coughs> mechanisms that we already have. The charter already allows me to delegate certain authorities. Obviously, I can't delegate you know, appointing fire chiefs or those sorts of things, but signing contracts, it, I can delegate other things any time um, for, for up to 30 days. So it basically is trying to align the practice with you know the charter with our practice and also what's practical um, and the, the way it was written before was somewhat confusing and um, and it's really not how how it worked I would actually come to you and say I think you should invoke this um, and so this is just a much clearer way to do it and we and it, it's in line with other charters as well around the state It's, it's, I, I just like to say from personal experience, and, and the other important inclusion of this is the addition that you can appoint, appoint um, an employee. So, uh, because serving as the council president at a, pine, at a point, for instance, when the mayor, you were abroad one time, and I was left not sleeping for a period of several weeks, and. Uh, Concerned about, the, and that'll come up in the next section of discussion too. But there, were, there the fire at, uh, at Round Hill Road occurred right before sure. you landed. Uh, having me as the designated mayor is a complete waste of time. I have no business being on a fire site. Um, I don't give any directives. I'm not, I'm not qualified to, and I had no business. So uh, delegating the authority in that case, in those circumstances, of emergency response, for instance, to the fire chief or whoever's doing the fire coordination is more appropriate. Once upon a time, we had counselors who felt that they were entitled to cross every fire line and every police uh, tape and, and, and somehow with our, our higher superior intelligence, we're supposed to manage and control these things. This makes more sense. I like codifying it. Makes it, it makes it clear, lest there be any confusion by someone who has delusions of grandeur when they become council president. I think to have it clearly stated and laid out here makes much more sense and actually is in the best interest of the city. So to be clear, if if the mayor had been gone for more than 10 days, then you still would have been up. <laughs> I still would have. That's you're, right. You're, you still would have watched the not, fire burn enough. You would not have been able to yes. yes. I don't go to fire grounds myself right. unless I'm right. asked to come yeah. to the fire grounds. So I, I do, we, we have a fire chief who does that. So Yes, yeah. it's 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 finally recognizing the authority where the authority belongs as opposed to where the authority is assumed. Councilman Ash. Yeah, all right, so I see us trying to do two different things here. And one of them has to do with, uh, you know, the, the mayor taking a leave of absence, going on vacation, going out of town for, for some reason, and delegating authority. And then there's this line about, if at any time the city council determines that the mayor is incapacitated and unable to perform the duties of the office, it may appoint its president. And that, um, and that tying these two together um, uh, under the, the, the term of absence, it, it, to me it's, it, it's not really clear. And, and in terms of um, that um, through my work, I'm dealing with when people are employed and not employed. And there's times where, you, where you're not fulfilling your duties and you're not, you know, therefore, uh, um, whoever is supervising can take corrective action. And that, um, that it may not need to reside here, whatever that definition is, of what an absence for, you know, a mayor, not this mayor, um, where they're not performing their duties. Um, but I, I'd like to have that a little bit clearer. Now, I, I've been, you know, Laura's been helping me. I've been in contact with HR. Um, I, I spoke with Sam earlier today to kind of get some clarification. And I have a call into the city solicitor. And, um, but I would just like to have that be a little bit clearer. I, I think we're, on, we're definitely on the right track here around taking out that piece of like, if the mayor wants to go on vacation, that's great. But if we're taking, you know, when we start getting into language around 
where we're going to take an action, I, th I, I think it, needs, it maybe doesn't need to be right here, but it needs to be outlined somewhere else where we can go to HR and say to a, that, you know, not this mayor, by the way, this one, he's really good, that there, there, should there be an instance that there's documentation that, you know, here you go, that's it right there. You know, that's how you measure the job performance so that it's not personalized. Okay, I'm gonna oh, there's, yeah, I, I need to respond. Yeah, so. I'll let the very okay. not yeah. so, absent mayor um, respond. This section A is called acting mayor. So basically the subsection is called acting mayor. Um, and so basically is describing the, the situations by which an acting mayor would be appointed. Um, and so there's, and it gives the two situations. One is because I'm affirmatively gonna be out of, unable to perform the office because I'm away for a longer period of time. Um, and then the other one is because of being incapacitated, which was essentially what was in the other one. It was just all mixed together. Right. Um, there would never be a circumstance where the city council would go to HR and do a performance review on me and, and, and say, you're being replaced because your performance is, I just, is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm no, unclear. What, what I'm saying is, if we're talking about council taking uh, an action uh -huh. that has to do with the executive, mm -hmm. I think it needs, you know, in, in a really, pro the, the most serious thing a council can do, mm -hmm. that it needs to be really clear as to what what, what are the measures for saying, you know, somebody's not performing their duties? Uh, it's not that they're not performing, it's that you're incapacitated exactly. and unable to perform. Um, not that I'm not performing the duties correctly, but that you're in, it's basically the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. Yeah, it's not the yeah. Yeah. About. It's to model, right. or the 25th Amendment, sorry, I messed that one up. Um, it's basically, there's a clause in the U.S. Constitution that says if the president becomes incapacitated, which um, I'll just that, uh, there's, a, there's a mechanism in place whereby a certain number of cabinet members can vote to actually say they're incapacitated, you know, whatever. Or if they, you know, have a stroke or, or you know, in the hospital, something like that. You know, we've, we've had some cases where um, we've had my predecessor had to have brain surgery um, and was going to be clearly incapacitated and under anesthesia. Um, and so that was a situation. So I think that's what it's referring to. So I think you just have to be, it's saying incapacitated and unable to perform, not exactly. that the mayor's not performing up to your standards, because really the voters are the ones well, who, yeah. So, but it sounds like we're trying to, uh, part of, there seems to be a performance thing related here in terms of, it's, it's talking a lot about absence. You know, we're talking about somebody not being here to perform their job, and so. No, I think, uh, no, I, well, I, I think it's actually the absence piece is one part of it, and then the second piece of it is a second part of it, which is that you're determined that the mayor is incapacitated. Um, so I think it's two separate things, where it used to be intertwined, sort of all mixed together. If you read the original, it said, whenever by reason of sickness, absence from the city, or other cause, um, then the council needs to take a vote of seven members. Um, and that was just a weird mechanism, um, because I could basically never I mean, unless you're, I mean, I, I, it was weird because only I knew when I was going to be out of town. The council wouldn't know it. So it, it's, it's better to use a notification <coughs> process right. saying I'm going to be out of town for more than 10 business days and so let you know that and then we know then that the um, council president would be acting mayor for periods beyond 10 days. Less than 10 days, there's a mechanism where I can then appoint people to cover the certain duties. Yeah. If, if I mean, as I read this, this is if you have a recalcitrant mayor who doesn't want to cede the authority even though that they're not here, they're gone. This gives the, this empowers the council to say, you've been gone for 20 days, you haven't written, you don't call, we don't get postcards, <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to move on. And this empowers the council to act. If, if a mayor were not accommodating the the terms that we require under their absence, that's what I that's how I read it. Well, that's how I was reading it too, and that's where I start getting into like, well, what does that mean? Because we have cell phones and email, and right. you know what what does that look like? You know, I and I, I know 
Sam well, briefly referenced it. The well, the, uh, and maybe this would help then if, if we add some language that would actually mandate some form of communication from the mayor uh, during their absence, indicating. Uh, I tweet a lot. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying, I mean, tomorrow, I'm, but yeah, see, tomorrow I'm going to Springfield for an economic development concert, uh, co conference, con Excellent. concert, um, or often I'll go to Boston. Like, I'll be out of the city, and but doing your but I'm yes. able, still able to perform. So, yes. if you read under our old charter, and even you could even argue under the current language of the charter, you could say oh, he's out of the city. So therefore, the city council should come have a meeting and appoint an acting mayor. Um, and that just isn't doesn't fit with modern standards, and so that was so. Actually, we're trying to do that. I mean, right. the, the last time we had a charter change, um, I was on vacation on the other on the on the ocean, and I was going to mailbox, et cetera, and signing, uh, you know, notarized letters to the clerk of the house um, to authorize changes to the charter. Um, so. That's because I could do that with technology. So, um, but it would not have been would not have made sense for the council to hold an emergency meeting to appoint somebody mm -hmm. um, when I was actually closer to the state house and could. So anyway, I'm just saying that we do conduct can conduct business even though I'm not in the city limits. I get yeah. it. But if I'm going to be out of the city limits for more than ten business days, then that gets to be that's like two solid weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that for continuity purposes, it's good to have somebody who can be the, you know, in case of emergency or something like that. So I think that was the thinking behind it. Yeah. But then incapacitation is a totally separate matter. Medical, mental, etc. But it's a high bar. <laughs> Seven votes. So it's not happening right now. No, no, not at all. Um, Councillor Rogers and then Councilor Thank Fox. you. Um, Mayor. On here, you're saying that the city council president, and I think I had mentioned that to you once before, you have an executive under you. Why wouldn't that person be considered we're the legislative part of the body? So I'm a little confused. Um, I think that, so what the first part of it says is that if it's going to be for um, uh, periods of 10 business days or less, that um, I can delegate authority to, you know, Susan Wright could sign contracts. Okay. I could delegate okay. other people to do other things. But if it's going to be for a period of longer than that, then, um, then um, do we want unelected people effectively being the chief executive officer okay. of the okay. city? And so that's the idea is to have somebody who's filling the role of chief elected officer um, if it's going to be a longer period of time. Um, that's all. Thank you. Councilor Foster. I think, um, Councilor Nash, to your point, I think it makes sense that the determination of incapacitated is actually, I think it should be vague because, um, you know, a seven council member vote is, is a pretty high bar. Um, but I think we've all come across situations where somebody doesn't recognize their own capaci incapacitation, whether it's you know, maybe it's, it's an addiction issue or a mental illness or a brain injury or, or whatever it is where somebody may not be able to carry out the functions of the job but may not personally be able to recognize that. And so, you know, I think it's a fairly extreme measure, but I think it makes sense that it be relatively vague because that, that's, a, that's a big high bar to clear to have seven counselors determine that somebody is incapacitated. Um, but I think if we start to list the reasons why or kind of narrowly define that, you know, I think you never quite know what you might miss in trying to foresee those circumstances. And when I talked to so the solicitor about it, he said, you know, incapacitated is a legal term. Mm -hmm. And there's right. a lot of jurisprudence around it, and there's a lot of, so there's that, also that protection. You know. We could add Yankee fan, we could add some other things. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but you know, I see what you're saying. Sorry. Uh, Council Mayor, then. Council yeah, I just I'm going back to um, Councillor Dwight's scenario. So in that scenario, with if this charter had been changed the way we are we're looking at it, are you saying that that the fire chief would have been an appropriate mayor? Well, in, 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 so, in you know substitute? situation specific and oh, okay, you know as as the mayor said, for instance, signing contracts, that was one of the things that I did while uh, the mayor was gone. But I'm not. I'm not 
up to speed on the contracts. Susan Wright, the financial director, uh, is more qual is the more qualified agent to uh, to sign those contracts. I did. I signed a few contracts, and some people got paid because I didn't mess up. But it was I didn't feel especially. Right. I'm just trying to understand the situation because the fire chief wouldn't necessarily be able to sign those contracts. No. So you're saying? Uh, no. I, the designation w would be appropriate to their station. Okay. And that and they're right. The city. I know. This, I, no offense intended, but the city actually can function without the mayor at times for for a rather extended period of time. But the mayor being the ex final executive authority. Yes. Uh, there eventually can, over a crude time, there are decisions that cannot be made without without the mayor signing off on it. But for particularly emergency situations and things like that, there are people who are already uh, would be so designated to serve in that capacity. So just to maybe clarify, and actually describes the things that I can delegate. Like there, I can't yeah. delegate away. Right. That's the I next can't, uh, somebody section. Can't go eight. Attend yeah. the school committee meeting for me. They can't. I right. can't appoint somebody to a permanent position. So there's already protections okay. on what I can and can't delegate. So it's only for temporary sorts of delegation. Yeah. And in that situation, it's not that the fire chief wasn't called. You were just called because you were acting mayor, just as you would have been called because you were If there's a say. major fire, I right. get contact. So he, him. Wasn't, if, if yeah. he, he wasn't in charge of like operations for the yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just that didn't change. <laughs> yes, I think I understand. That. Okay. I was in charge of staying out of the way. <laughs> well, I guess that I wonder then at the beginning here where it says, uh, you know, to uh, delegate to a qualified city officer, if that shouldn't be, or employee, if that shouldn't be spelled out more. Um, if there are specific things that should be handled by one particular member of the, you know, city. Why, why maybe that should be well, spelled you, you out? Could, That's to his discretion. You, you could reference Aaron. section 3 8. And that yeah. Would, so it, uh, uh, you can say. It actually does reference 3 8. Well, look, sure language. enough, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. The so authority, the delegate, the authority. Otherwise, you'd have, 3 8. 8. you'd have to include yeah. 3 8 in there. Yeah. So I can only delegate under 3 8, okay. which is already in the charter. So my, the, my limits of my delegation is are limited already by 3-8. Right. In this case, we're talking about the acting mayor, of course, and they would be so similarly limited by no. description. No, 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 no. The acting mayor can't delegate. Just This is a separate right. No, I'm session. sorry. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The powers of the acting mayor be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other? Oh, Mr. Moulton. Um, just to be clear, um, the key to this section 37 is, as the mayor pointed out, acting mayor. And this spells out when the city needs to have an acting mayor appointed. And there are, uh, and we tried to, to, as the mayor has pointed out, we tried to recognize that in today's world, every time the mayor leaves the city, uh, there's no need for an acting mayor. We <coughs> felt that two, two weeks or 10 business days was a reasonable amount of time to have the mayor physically absent from the city without an act, acting mayor. But beyond that, uh, then we felt that uh, sh uh, there should be an acting mayor named. The, the other instance is incapacitation, and that doesn't mean the, fi the mayor is physically <coughs> absent from the city. That really hasn't, that hasn't changed. I mean, we, that language uh, existed and we kept that language in as the second example of when an acting mayor uh, would be appointed by the council. Thank you. I mean, it might be easier just to rename the section acting mayor, but or or temporary absence or incapacitation of the mayor, or I, I don't know, because it does it before it was called temporary absence of the mayor, but then it it went on to say more things than just absence of the mayor. So maybe that would clear it up for what you. What about temporary know. absence of the mayor, comma acting mayor? That's fine. Or like I think word. I think he was concerned that incapacitation didn't have to do with being absent. It was that I'm just I here and. Right. Place. And it may not be temporary either, yeah. but <laughs> depending on the capacity. Oh, no. <laughs> we are. Remember, we're, we're speaking of mass. all mayors, not the one. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Nothing personal. You're right. <laughs> 
Okay, so is there a suggestion for amending the title of this section? I was just saying temporary absence or incapacitation okay. of the mayor. Um, because that would be more descriptive of the two t times that um, and you want to invoke an acting mayor. Friendly amendment. Okay. Okay, any Second. further discussion on this section? No? Answer Neff. Well, I, I, so, um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for what they've said and um, that I think my concerns have been addressed. And what was the, Sam knows this, what was the word that uh, the city solicitor used? He didn't want to put too much into this. Overprescribed. Overprescribed. And that I want to recognize that, you know, I don't want to do that either. I just, that was like the window where I saw in these words here, like, we could get into sticky stuff. So, anyway, so. Okay. Any further discussion on this perfectly prescribed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to leave this emotionally taxing scenario situation. <laughs> There's more to come. <laughs> All those in favor of um, uh, amending the title, uh, this deletion, and this addition. Uh, did I get recommending in there? Yep. Please say aye. 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 Objections. Okay, moving on. I don't, this may still be emotionally taxing, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> section 3 9, vacancy in office of mayor. Okay, we're going to delete a lot here. So, starting um, with A, this, everything I'm going to read is being deleted. If a vacancy in the office of mayor occurs prior to the 18th month of the term for which the mayor is elected, the city council shall, under section 8-1, uh, order a special election to be held within 90 days following the date the vacancy is created to fill such vacancy until the next regular city election. The person elected to that special city election, election, elected at that special city election shall take office immediately. If a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date the vacancy is created, a special election need not be held and the office shall be filled by vote at a regular city election. B, if a vacancy, still being deleted, B, if a vacancy in the office of mayor occurs between the 19th and 22nd month of the term for which the mayor is elected, the city council president shall serve as mayor until the next regular city election. The city council president serving as mayor under this subsection shall take office immediately and serve for the balance of the then unexpired term. C, being deleted, if a vacancy in the office of mayor occurs between the 23rd and 40th month of the term for which the mayor is elected, the city council shall, under section 8-1, order a special election to be held within 90 days following the date the vacancy is created to serve for the balance of the then unexpired term. D being deleted, if a vacancy in the office of mayor occurs during or after the 41st month of the term for which the mayor was elected, the city council president shall serve for the balance of the then unexpired term. E being deleted, in the event that the city council president is unable to serve as mayor under this section, the city council shall elect from among its membership a person to serve as mayor. That is all being deleted, this is being added. A. If a vacancy in the office of mayor occurs, the city council president shall serve as mayor until a mayor is elected and qualified under this section. In the event that the city council president is unable to serve as mayor under this subsection, the city council shall elect from among its membership a person to serve as mayor. The city council president or other councilor elected by the city council hereunder shall take office immediately upon such vacancy. B. Upon a vacancy in the office of mayor, the city council shall, under section 2 6, C, uh, I, did you say I? I it's two. two. Yeah. Just two. Call a special meeting of the city council, and the city council shall, under section 8 1, order a special election to be held within 90 days following the date the vacancy is created to fill that vacancy until the next regular city election. The person elected at a special city election shall be sworn to office immediately. C. 
upon the, upon the adoption for an order for a special election under subsection B, the city clerk shall set the special election calendar as follows. Nomination papers shall be made, within, made available within seven days of the vacancy. Nomination papers shall be filed with the Board of Registrars of Voters within 28 days of the vacancy. The Board of Registrars shall certify such nomination papers within 30 days of the vacancy, and the candidate shall file such certified nomination papers with the city clerk within 35 days of the vacancy. A preliminary election shall be held within 65 days of the vacancy, if required. A special election shall be held within 90 days of the vacancy. D. Notwithstanding the provisions of subsection B, no special election shall be ordered if the vacancy occurs in month 16, 17, 18, 40, 41, or 42 of the term for which the mayor was elected. In such case, the city council president or other councilor elected by the city council shall serve as mayor until the next regular city election. The person elected at such regular city election shall be sworn to office immediately and shall serve a four-year term. E, notwithstanding the provisions of subsection B, no special election shall be ordered if the vacancy occurs in month 47 or 48 of the term for which the mayor was elected and the mayor will not be serving another term. In such case, the mayor elect shall be sworn to office immediately and shall serve the remainder of the mayoral term and the four-year term for which such person was elected. Uh, I'm just going to read F, which stands as it is, um, but just to close this out, any person serving as mayor under this section shall receive the compensation then in effect for the office of mayor. I move that the deletion and addition uh, be recommended. Second. Second that. Made and seconded. This one's this one's a mouthful, <coughs> and in fact, actually, <laughs> I. I um, <laughs> When we were voting on this, Stan actually broke this down in such a way, and this one was a tough nut to crack, particularly one problem that presented itself that we had not considered before, of course, was that the mayoral term is four years, the council term is two years. Um, uh, this took a lot of backwards math and clock revisions in order to make this make sense, even though in reading it, I'm surprised everyone still looking relatively awake and attentive so this is <laughs> but and Stan as I recall when when we when we were when we were going over this you actually did a very good summation I don't know if you're still up to that uh, well I, I, I'm not sure I am either this is uh, this is <laughs> headache inducing this yes. particular section. Yeah. Um, and, and you're giving me too much credit this was vetted by the city clerk uh, and the solicitor. Uh, we actually had the city clerk uh, sit down and she came up with a little spreadsheet with all these dates to make sure that they would that they would work. And the um, as, as Councillor Dwight points out, the, the, the driver the driver for this is the, the fact that the mayor now serves a four-year term and in fact there are regular city elections every two every two years hence the reference to 16th 17th 18th or 40 41 or 42nd months because those would be the months coming up on the next city election whether or not the mayor was was on the ballot that particular election um, and the other I think the other major driver is that uh, uh, in section, the new section E, it would be the, if, if, the, if the current mayor uh, were not standing for re-election, we're not going to serve another term, then the, uh, the uh, uh, person elected that, at that election in November would be sworn to office immediately rather than waiting until January. Hmm. I think those are the, I mean, there's a lot of language here that if you try to sit down and figure it all out, it's, it's going to be, as I say, headache inducing. <laughs> Those are the two prime movers that, that I recall, the mayor uh, and other. No, it's, uh, this was definitely a math problem. And I think it was written thinking, I, I think it, when we all read it back when it was approved in 2012, it made sense, but then when we actually unpacked it, it didn't make sense. Um, and it didn't really fit with, um, it didn't fit with the four-year cycle of the mayor and your two-year cycle of the council. So this actually captures it better. That last section would be like um, 
like the Mayor Sean Dunphy, uh, you know, who was appointed to a judgeship in the last months of his of his term and was not running again. And so, an election you could put somebody right into office. <coughs> that would be the key, you know. Um, and that sort of happened with the city clerk as well, um, because our city clerk had retired, and so when the city clerk got elected, they were sworn in immediately to be the city clerk. So it would be silly to go a few months without a city clerk when you're filling a vacancy. Um, and that actually happened, you know, it happens with councilors, right? They just, uh, was it with yours or was it with Owens? I don't remember. It Somebody, was with me. Yeah, it was yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah. So you just assumed, you didn't, you, next you didn't wait till here. January right. to be inaugurated because there was a vacancy. You just sat right down and, and began. So anyway, so I think, I think this definitely <laughs> captures yeah. it, but it was thank you to the solicitor and the clerk and everyone who mapped this out because um, it may not have been caught. It, the, under the old charter, there were no such definitions or requirements made, and in fact, actually, the mayor serves as a perfect example of what happens there. His, uh, he assumed the office without under the old charter and was compensated as a councilor, not as a mayor. Am I right? That's and so, so he could, the the mayoral salary is at the time it was five thousand dollar year stipend. We had a mayor that we got real cheap for five grand, and and <laughs> when I was council president under the old charter, I also lived in abject fear of the possibility of me becoming mayor. I wanted very much for the mayor to stay healthy. I was very concerned when he traveled. I, I, he. he, he there were no conditions and terms laid out. It was just the council president would assume the, the, the mayor mm -hmm. position without without any prospect of a special election for that matter. You just serve out the term. Um, so this is not convoluted language. It's difficult, but it actually does make pragmatic sense. The um, Older, the version previous to this was did not take into consideration that another election came every two years. It was presuming the mayoral election every four years. In this case, this makes much more sense. And the object is also, of course, um, if at all possible, try to avoid a special election and the expense associated with that. Um, still pretty tight time clock, as you can see, but given depending when the vacancy occurs. But um, I, I don't want to say, trust me, this makes sense, because <laughs> if you forced me to explain it, I wouldn't be able to, <coughs> right? But the fact is that this was, this got a great deal of consideration and deliberation and, and, and stands too modest. He actually did stop us from wandering off into the ethers by, of confusion, so. <laughs> Councilor Jarrett. Uh, section D. The, the last sentence, the person elected at such regular city election shall be sworn to office immediately and shall serve a four-year term. Could that be construed to think that their term would begin right after the election and then end in four years, uh, not go all the way to January, which is longer than four years? Right. That's a good point. The four years doesn't start at the point of that special election. Yeah. It would right. just be the four. It would be the four-year term until the next election in four years. I, so yeah, I like say the the remainder of the four-year term. Um, the I would ask the that would be one we want to ask the solicitor about. Yeah, we look at this we could we get done. Um, I, I I would say under the remainder of the four-year term as opposed to the four-year term because. Well, no, it's a no, new term. It's a new it's term. It's a new term. It's just they go into office immediately. So instead right. of starting in January, they start and that's, that's in so. But if it's a, the special election occurs on the two-year strike, yeah, but then the this doesn't change the cycle of when we have elections. It's just. It just but it would saying, change the. So, like stat. Pam Powers um, got was sworn in as the city clerk the day of the election, but we didn't then say her election that her term ended then. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I think that. I think right. Well, clarify this for me. Um, the say, this special mayoral election occurred this most recently, but 
that's not the beginning of a four-year term that would expire in four years because that would be the remainder of the term. Uh, the may next mayoral election would come up the following year. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And I and, and I understanding what your your concern is. Well, the, all the other language makes it clear that you fill out the remainder of the term right. or do something different. But in this one case um, where, and it's well, only when the vacancy is in month 16, 17, 18, 40, 41, or 42, then um, they would take office right after the election and it should be something like four year, you know, the January, until they serve until January and then a four year term beyond. But the, but the sentence immediately preceding that says that they'll be elected, uh, you know, she'll serve as mayor until the next regular city election. Right. So it sort of spells out it's their right. term. All, all the last sentence says is when they assume office. It's just sort of saying that instead of being inaugurated the first uh, two, Monday in January, you get inaugurated immediately. So I don't think it's changing the, the, the dates of the term. It's just saying when you get, when you <coughs> Yeah, if the city solicitor feels that that is clear, but okay. to me that that would say it should be four years, two months. Right. Or, okay. But if legally, f four year term means the January to January plus with that extra time, then that's fine. I just want to make sure that's okay. the case. We can ask him to check that and see, because um, we have a city clerk who's serving under that exact same circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, or was serving right. under that circumstance, right? Yeah, yeah, because she was elected to fill a vacancy and was right. sworn in immediately. So, um, although currently she's serving in, in, by dual being duly elected, <laughs> exactly. But the, yeah. the 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 vote prior to that, right. um, yeah. Okay. Okay, we can check on that. So, sorry. Oh, yeah, council. Well, in Section E, it talks about um, the mayor-elect shall be sworn to office immediately and shall serve the remainder of the mayoral term and the four-year term for which such person was elected. So that that is clear in in for Section E, um, and perhaps there's a similar language that would make sense in Section D. Can I say something to that? So, in the subsection before that, they could. They could, the mayor could leave and a new person could be sworn in with two years left in that unexpired term. We're not saying you would serve the rest of the two years that are remaining plus four years. So that language couldn't be copied over for that reason. I get what you're saying. But um, yeah, you couldn't say the remainder of the right. term. So just, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but just to clarify, so currently the Mayor, got my dates right, was elected 2017 and would be up for re-election 2021. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So say we get into a special election and it happened in 2019. Does that mean that then the next election will be 2023 and we would just be changing the cycle? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Couldn't move on. No, that's okay. Well, that's what, that's what yeah. my confusion is. Is that point in fact what we're doing? Yeah, like from then on, would it be so instead of the four-year terms that had been before, Staggered. it might be two years, right. and then it's four years from there, and so it right. just sort of shifts. That was that was that. my question because they be then you could suddenly find the mayor run concurrent with councilors, right? Um, and yeah, yeah, they, they already do. They do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right? But I mean the. the but then there's one off. Then there's two years where it's off. They're not. They're not running the same thing. And I don't. And if that's the case, that's the case. But I don't know if that's. We haven't. That's not entirely clear. That would be the case now, anyways. Though. Yeah. Jared. Um. <laughs> so. In section B. Um, which ha happens except in these special cases. So section B is you know the special election. Mm -hmm. In the special election, the vacancy is filled until the next regular city election. So in that case, it would not be 
right. more than two years because that could or that could never happen um, their term the, for the, if it's a special election then the term is short but in these special cases when it's closer to a regularly scheduled election right in D and E then it will be a reg it will be a regular election plus four years we're all in agreement on that I would um, <laughs> I've made, so I've made this recommendation there's there's a motion on the floor but actually what I would like to do now mm -hmm. is to remove that motion and change it to have this reviewed a, a little more granularly by the solicitor relative to these questions that we're all just a little squishy on so that uh, we're going to do a schoolhouse rock video about I, that would <laughs> that would help a lot so but yes I think uh, given the sort of general kind of confusion and I'll own most of it uh, most of the confusion um, that it, it wouldn't make sense to actually forward this without the clarity that's necessary. So. Okay, so that motion has uh, been. Um, can she still speak to it? If you well, that's it's it's a motion. If someone seconds it, then we can speak. I'll to second it. Okay. And then to the purpose of discussion. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was going to address F, so I guess that 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 was why we had to to discuss that we still had to have a motion even about the other. Right. Um, no, my question was just if under if any person serving as mayor, is that like a special status? Because w was there any, any ethical concerns about compensation, mayoral compensation for a city councilor? I'm just thinking of that video that we watched and about taking second jobs in the city. I just want to make sure. Well, that's that interesting too. I don't know. <laughs> That's you mean conflict of interest law. Yeah. Once you're mayor, you're no longer a city councilor. Yeah. That's right. Oh, you don't I see. So you're not doing city both. Right. right. I see. Okay. And if you're acting mayor, you can't participate in the city council. Oh, the okay. Right. I did which one? I was acting mayor. So right. Was, well, but the mayor was the chair of the city council. Right. So okay. it's kind of just a weird thing. But, yeah. Okay. So that so clears it up. Right. Thank you. Does that need to be yeah. spelled out? No, that is spelled it out. It is. Okay. Yeah, that's spelled out elsewhere. Great. Thank you. Okay. So. There's no longer a motion on the floor, or no, do we need? No, only a request of the solicitor to review. Okay, great. So we can move on to a section. Actually, that, I'm sorry, that was a motion, so it'll probably require a vote. The motion is to, to uh, refer this to the city solicitor for review. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Objections? Okay. So close. Uh, okay. Section five. Dash one, um, other elected officials. So, did I miss four points? Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Sorry. Four. Oh, okay. Sorry. Apologies. Section four dash six, filling of vacancies. Whenever a vacancy occurs. On the school committee, the president of the city council shall, within 30 days following the date of the vacancy, call a joint meeting of the city council and school committee to fill the vacancy. The city council and school committee, this is being added, shall appoint by majority vote of those present, choose is being deleted, a person to fill the vacancy from among the voters entitled to vote for the office. Persons elected is being deleted, appointed is being added, to fill a vacancy by the city council and school committee shall serve only until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. The candidate elected to an office filled by appointment prior to the election shall be sworn to the office immediately to complete the then unexpired term in addition to the term for which elected. No vacancy shall be filled under this section if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date the vacancy is declared to exist. Now this is being, this sentence is being deleted. Persons serving as school committee members under this section shall not be entitled to have the words, quote, candidate for re-election, end quote, printed with that person's name on the election ballot. What is being added is the process and procedures by which the city council and school committee shall jointly fill vacancies under this section shall be established by ordinance. Okay. 
I move to include these recommendations. Second it. And made and seconded. Um, <laughs> uh, in large part, this is actually basically explaining what it is we already do. Um, as opposed to choo choose is too vague a term, how it didn't lay out how they were to be chosen, but this is how we did, and we have done this a number of times now over the years. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right, right. Rocks, paper, scissors. Uh, no, so this is done by a majority vote until such, and you keep voting until uh, one candidate receives a majority in the event of a tie. Um, and that process is laid out here. Um, the term, changing the term from elected to appointed, uh, there was some concern because electing can mean an, uh, an awful lot, and it, the appointment makes more sense because they're not the person who is being appointed is only elected by representatives. They're not elected by the, uh, the public in general. We felt that term was more appropriate to be applied for an election of the public, and instead the term appointment made more sense. <coughs> the, um, as, as Sam actually explained in legislative matters, this whole issue of candidate for re-election is being recommended to be, to, and you'll, we'll come up again to that in a bit, the whole designation on a ballot of candidate for re-election is going to be struck for all candidates, uh, well, or otherwise. Um, and then adding the process and procedures by which the city council and school committee shall jointly fill the vacancies under this section shall be established by ordinance. That's essentially a requirement for us to uh, uh, do just that, which I don't know. We have never done that. So that needs to be done. And here it is that codified. So I think that's an accurate summation. Is that going to take issue with that summation? Okay. Any discussion, comments on this section? No. Okay. Um, all those in favor of recommending these additions and deletions to section 4 6, filling of vacancies, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Uh, Councilor Mary has stepped out. Okay. Moving on now to 5-1. Uh, so this is Article 5, Other Elected Officials, Section 5-1, City Clerk. This entire section is being deleted from this uh, article. Um, I will read it. Everything I'm reading is being deleted. Section 5-1, City Clerk. A, election eligibility. The City Clerk shall be elected by the voters of the City at large. Any voter shall be eligible to hold the office of City Clerk. The City Clerk shall devote full time to the office and shall not hold any other elective public office. The City Clerk shall perform all the duties and exercise the powers incumbent by the law upon the office. B, term of office. The term of office of the City Clerk shall be two years, beginning on the first Monday in, in the January after the election, except when the first Monday falls on a legal holiday, in which event the term shall begin on the following day and until the city clerk's successor has been qualified. C, compensation. The city council shall, by ordinance, establish the salary for the office of the city clerk. D, temporary absence. In case of temporary absence, city clerk, the mayor shall appoint an acting city clerk. The mayor shall be the sole judge of whether a temporary absence exists in the office of city clerk. Um, e, filling a vacancy. Whenever a vacancy occurs in the office of city clerk, the city council shall, within 30 days following the date of that vacancy, act to fill a vacancy. The person elected to fill a vacancy by the city council shall serve until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. The person elected at such regular city election shall take office immediately. No vacancy shall be filed under this section. If a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date of the vacancy, a person serving as city clerk under the section shall not be entitled to have the words, quote, candidate for re-election, quote, printed next to the person's name on the election ballot. Um, All of that is being deleted. Uh, uh, <coughs> make a recommendation for this uh, to uh, commit this deletion for the of discussion. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded. So 
So this actually is the bigger, uh, this, there's a reorder that's required once we, uh, once one, and if, if we get to the big chunks, if the city clerk is in fact agreed upon to uh, be appointed as opposed to elected, this section would no longer be necessary. So this is this is presuming yeah, that's we have that actually as the last item on this list. I'm really sorry. It was it's listed in no, the no, cheat no, sheet. And, and that's why I'm explaining five one that's, and no, no, that's uh, why I'm explaining it. You could have stopped me sooner, you know. Well, no, I, I thought it was beautiful. And I think <laughs> it was, so the, but <laughs> when we get to that point, it would be that's the purpose for this recommended deletion. Yeah. So. Uh, but we haven't crossed that bridge yet, so we could, if you want. I don't see any reason why not. That we're at that point. I we did, so we did kind of agree to take the small sips first, yeah. but I think we've done a pretty good job with that so far. Is the will to cross the bridge? <laughs> I moved to cross the bridge. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're on it. So, um, okay. Is there a motion? Uh, yes, so I, I, I okay. move to delete this, and um, and then <clears throat> and then I would also add follow the recommendation of the committee to make the city clerk's position an appointed position instead of elected. So that's the full extent of the motion. I second that. And that's been seconded. Discussion. If I may, just to frame it. Um, this actually, this also enjoyed a great deal of review. In fact, actually, even some special testimony, which I actually wasn't there for. So, um, the majority, the vast majority, of city clerks in um, in Massachusetts are now appointed. Once upon a time, this made sense long, long time ago when you had part-time mayors and you had the, you wanted to keep the treasurer. Uh, separate from the, the mayor's sphere and you want to keep the uh, the assessor from the mayor's sphere I think and also to keep the um, uh, city clerk so that they they could function autonomously presumably uh, as municipal governance became more and more a sophisticated practice and required professional skills uh, in Northampton experiences and I'll and I'll keep people's names out of this, but I'll use the treasurer as an example. We had a treasurer who served for 25 years. Her assistant um, was the next in line. She was presumed to be the next in line. She was tapped and elected, and unfortunately never trained, and didn't really have the qualifications for treasurer. It wasn't her fault, but she was stuck in a really untenuous position, and consequently the city was in a very tenuous position as a result. And. Uh, not for her lack of trying and trying to drink from a fire hose, but it just didn't work out. The What's required under these positions now uh, is a professionalism that isn't otherwise realized, or you run the risk of not getting that. If you have an election where you just vote a favorite or somebody who's well known but not qualified, and we certainly we've all experienced that in, on so many levels, but this is this position is far too important at this point and it's been recognized by many municipalities that this needs to be a person who is vetted as an employee essentially of the city um, Pam Powers is an excellent employee and we've been quite fortunate that we actually have her but we're not voting on Pam Powers here we're voting on the position so that that we have to remember that and the this was actually considered rather strongly the last time the charter, when the charter was being revised, but it was politically contentious. There was some resistance from the clerk's office, for one, and then from a number of citizens who were opposed. Uh, and the uh, review committee at that time felt rather than lose the potential of a modern revised charter for this one very political hot button issue, they decide to remove it from the discussion. Now, it seems more appropriate, and as uh, Stan had mentioned when in his presentation, that there was uni unanimity on this. There were every, uh, including, I, I think, from virtually everyone who ever spoke to this or testified to this fact that that the, everyone felt 
the appointment made so much more sense and it was in the best interest of the city. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I sent a letter to the Charter Commission and then also came forth. And I have to say, and I agree with you, this has nothing to do with our city clerk right now. But the only qualifications for an elected city clerk is being 18 years of age, a resident of Northampton, a registered voter in Northampton, and not convicted of a certain disqualifying crimes. That's a qualification. Someone could be elected as a city clerk because of popularity, which you just heard, or name recognition, which that does happen, with absolutely no knowledge of what the office does, and get elected and found not to be qualified for the job. And there is no mechanism for removal from office. They will remain city clerk until the next election. Northampton has been very fortunate to have elected city clerks who had worked in the office for many, many years and were qualified for the position of city clerk. But that may not always be the case. If the position was appointed by the mayor or administration and confirmed by city council, the mayor or the administration could establish qualifications for education and experience. Elected city clerks have no job description and answer only to the voters. This job is extremely valuable here in the city. And I think qualifications is very, very important versus elected versus non-elected. And I think that this should be a non-elected position. Appointed would also allow for a larger field of qualified candidates, which would bring a high level of continuity to the office. If the appointed city clerk turns out to be a bad appointment, then the mayor or the administration would have the mechanism to fire the appointment. Being able to go outside of Northampton for qual qualified candidates is an essential part of making sure you have the best candidate for the office. And that's what I had stated to the Charter Commission and I also wrote this letter and I think the qualifications are extremely important. Thank you. I, I did forget to mention that the uh, former city clerk, uh, Wendy Mazza, also recommends this. Um, she was originally resistant to it, but she has since changed her mind and now speaks in favor of it. Please. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Dwight, I think, wasn't it our treasurer at one time was an elected position, George Zimmerman, and Susan Wright went to him about feeling of not being elected and going non elected and he agreed to that and by doing that there was such a change in the overall position and how that whole between finance and all that they all worked like a team that was excellent other thoughts or comments would you like to weigh in yeah, I just I would say that the other the other key thing is, um, and M, uh, when we worked with the Collins Center who helped us with the last charter, um, you know one of the things to look at is that, like the treasurer, like the city clerk, like the board of health for a time, which was kind of quasi elected um, by the council, um, they're governed by laws and they basically are carrying out laws. They're not a policy making. They don't have any policy making ability. They're basically administrators, unlike the council or the school committee or the mayor or the Smith Folk, you know, trustees who are actually making policy for the schools or making policy for the city. Um, they're really, they, you know, the election laws, they have to carry out the election laws. 
uh, you know, the custodian of the records, they have to carry them out. They have to meet all the filing deadlines for, you know, <coughs> lawsuits and public records. I mean, so there's not, they're really an administrator who are following laws. So that's why it's really not, and the same thing with the treasurer position. I mean, the treasurer, we were electing basically the most popular person in Northampton to manage a $100 million treasury of the city, um, which is what no one really ever does anymore. Um, I think even Holyoke moved away from that uh, recently. Um, they still have an elected city clerk. But I mean, slowly communities, and the DOR has recommended this strongly, um, and, and in terms of the statistics, there's like 46 or 47 cities in Massachusetts, and I think we're one of only five that still has an elected uh, a city clerk. You know, East Hampton has an appointed city clerk. Amherst has an appointed city clerk. Uh, many of the communities around us have appointed city clerks. So um, so in terms of the whole independence factor, they, they don't, they, there's, they're actually, they're following the law and they take an oath to carry out the law, just like the health director takes an oath to carry out the health laws, just like the building commissioner takes, you know, is carrying out the building code, just like the, you know, on and on and on. Um, so I think that, that that's the other piece I think is important for people to understand. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor. Uh, I had a question for the mayor, and maybe someone else knows the answer. Or with, with appointments, is, are they usually in other towns that you're, you're referring to, are they re appointed by the mayor or by city council? It's a mix. It's a mix. Um, it's a mix. In some communities, um, it depends if the city clerk is still the clerk to the council. Mm -hmm. um, and then in that case, usually the city council does it because they're also the person who is um, the record keeper directly. So in that case, it's usually flipped. But in communities where that's not the case, it's usually the the, the situation we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, we used to have prior two city clerks ago, the city clerk used to sit where Laura sat right. um, and used to actually take the minutes for the meeting mm -hmm. and was the, and then, um, uh, and then that changed, and th there was a charter change that happened, and then this council was given, its, you know, created its own clerk separate from the city clerk. Um, so in that case, it, it would make sense probably, since you would not only be appointing the city clerk, but your primary kind of employee, if it, as it were. Um, so I think the recommendation from the city solicitor was just to follow the same appointment process that we have for all positions with the mayor council. Thank you. Yep. Other questions or comments? Councillor Thorpe, are you thinking about one? I can come back to you. <laughs> Councillor Foster, do I see your hand go up? Yeah, I'm, I'm mid thought bubble, but I'll try. I can give you some time. I'm um, ready. Whichever oh, bubble bursts first, for the mayor. go for oh, it. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. If you can answer, Mr. Mr. Mayor, when did they start? I know there's, you know, 43 out of 48, I believe. Uh, towns or cities have converted from elected to appointed. When did this process really start to take off? Do you, can you? I think it's just been more, as, as um, communities have updated their charters, I think over time, it's been, it's been a common provision. Um, and Holyoke tr um, also tried to do this with one of their charters, and actually the charter failed because of it. Um, so it does, it is a political office in some communities. Um, uh, and so in some communities, I don't know, was Chelsea elected or appointed? appointed. So he, 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 this is a former treasurer collector of Chelsea, um, and they had an appointed. Um, so it really, it depends on the political culture, I think, of the community. Um, but I think we've got Holyoke, Pittsfield, Lawrence, maybe um, Northampton, and maybe Methuen are the five, just off the top of my head. Um, so it's sort of an older school approach, um, and, um, Maybe Agawam too. Now that I think about it. No, I don't think. What's that? Chicopee. It looks like. Maybe Chicopee. And, yeah. Um, so um, it's definitely the older model, and um, depending on the political dynamics of the community, most communities have tried to move away from it. Mm -hmm. And you know that was the other problem when um, when Wendy Maza um, resigned. Um, her assistant, who was couldn't be appointed to fill the position because she didn't live in Northampton. Um, and you had to be a resident of Northampton. So like the most obvious person to take the role because they were not a resident of Northampton were not qualified because they were treated as an elected official. So that's the other, I know that's one of the reasons former clerk Maza has cited that it sort of once she saw how it played out um, and the fact that you had to be a resident of Northampton and there's very few people 
meet necessarily in a community that are qualified to step in and be the city clerk, other than maybe somebody who's already in the office. Wendy Mazza was the assistant clerk um, who replaced the former clerk at the time. But it just was lucky she lived in Northampton. So, yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And yep. Thank you, Councilor Sierra, for noticing my thought bubble. Big time. Any other bubbles? Do, do yeah, I just wanted to say that I originally, when I first saw this recommendation, um, was challenged a little bit with the thought of, you know, so many of the recommendations by the Charter Review Committee are expanding sort of the electorate. Um, Robbie Sullivan really passed along her thoughts and a lot of her research, and she did a significant amount. And um, it gave me some, some really solid background information, and, and it's, it's a change that, that I support, um, you know, some of the, the guidelines for whether an uh, appointment should, or um, I'm sorry, a position should be appointed or elected, you know, centering around policy, and like you said, the, the qualifications um, for the job, um, it makes a lot of sense to me that it would be an appointed position. The other thing I would say is that um, it, it's also created an odd situation because the city clerk is, is a department head and runs an office and is and like a lot of and a lot of her peers in city government are also are are on a salary scale and get regular cost of living and get um, whereas the city clerk is an administrator by all intents and purposes but her because she's an elected official her salary remains static. Um, so she, so that's just another sort of inequity between the city clerk and the other department heads who she mostly resembles, um, except for the fact that she, he or she is an elected official. So that would also correct that as well. Um, and the current clerk used to be an employee, and then you know you lose all your vacation, all your sick time, all your everything because you're an elected official, and all you have is a salary in the ordinance book. So that's the other thing that's a little bit odd. And the, you know, the former city clerk, had that had been an issue as well <coughs> that she talked about. Because um, you've got the auditor, you've got the assessor, you've got the treasurer, you've got these other department heads who are you know, eligible for these sort of fringe benefits that you're not eligible for because you're an elected official, even though you operate just like any other administrator. Hmm. Yeah. The other, um, the other, uh, Another reason for the change that was voiced is uh, the potential awkwardness for having a city clerk uh, running an election for which he or she could be on a, on a ballot in a yeah. contested race. Yes, makes sense. That, that was a big one, actually. That was, <laughs> that was a really obvious big one. one. Was, <laughs> because under, under state law, there's, <laughs> there is an existing conflict of interest and the Except. rules were different as they applied to cities as they do to towns. Yes. Towns are given a, a pass. Cities, on the other hand, it's a kind of weird, mushy, amorphous rule that doesn't afford any protection to the clerk, uh, or for the elections, for that matter. For that. So, yeah, I thank you, Stan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that was actually one of the initial drivers for the discussion, actually. So, it's I'm glad Stan reminded us. Any. Yes, Councillor Jarrett. Pop bubble. Yep, I saw it. <laughs> um, speaking off of uh, Councillor Mayori's uh, question about you know who appoints, um, I talked about asked some questions about this in legislative matters. Um, so when a <clears throat> when a mayor appoints, we have one person who is um, <clears throat> in charge of the person who does the elections. And there is potentially a, you know, you could argue that the mayor could put some pressure on the clerk to do elections in a certain way. And if, if, may, if there were some bad actors in, 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 in place, um, if the council were to appoint, you would have to, ha you, you may have this, a similar problem, but it's, you're unlikely to have as many uh, potential issues I'm, I'm not I just wanted to raise that issue I'm not I don't think I'm I, I'm not I'm okay with moving forward I definitely think it should be appointed and I agree with what others have said about the professionalism of the job and having people outside of the city uh, be able to ser <coughs> serve but just to be thinking about um, the those that that, that Potential power dynamic. I know that you know we will appoint, we will approve any appointment, um, but just in terms of like who your boss is and that those people are elected. 
was important to remember, of course, though, is that there are very strict and well-defined laws that dictate, as the mayor said, that, that, that the clerk is beholden to. And in fact, they're, that's their higher authority, ultimately. Is, and in fact, if they're fired for doing their job, the mayor can be held to accounts on that. Mm -hmm. If in, in, a, in, in a more amorphous appointing authority like a council, that, that there's, it's, a, it's a little, the protection becomes less well-defined. And as you point out, um, we have the authority to approve the appointment. The reverse wouldn't be true. Whoever we approve, the mayor would not have the serve as the counterbalance or the check against our bad actors if we have bad actors, if you have a block of uh, counselors who actually uh, would behave badly too. So th those potential will, will always exist, but the final word is whether the clerk meets the prescription of the law exactly. and all those terms and conditions. And if the mayor asks the uh, clerk to subvert the law, that in and of itself is a crime. And the, and the mayor should be held accountable for that, and there are, and there are means by which you can do that. A little less difficult to do it with. It's a little more difficult to do it if there's a body of nine that's, uh, that have no other administrative authority also. So this is clear, it's cleaner, it's, it's, it is, there are no other positions that we, um, that we authorize and approve. And you know, I would say, if we were, if this concern were to be dominant, then the same issue would apply relative to the treasurer, the assessor, and the other positions. So, so, um, yeah. And I take your point, but that is that's been a concern. That was a concern that was uh, brought up over and over again when the last time it was resisted. It wasn't a winning argument to me, but it, but the argument never came up because. For political reasons, it was removed from uh, the original proposal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that you know that we're discussing what could be really difficult things, and that right now there's not a lot of tension in the room because the people who are performing these positions are really doing a great job. And that, um, and I just want to put that out there that I'm grateful for that, and uh, because if there if there were concerns, that would be this would be a much more heightened conversation. And right now we're just looking at, you know, rules on the back of the game board box, you know, about how it's how it's going to play out. And um, so, can I just say also that you know it, it, um, we would we would create a job description that would be run through our classification plan. It would be graded. It would, um, when somebody, they would go through a, it wouldn't just be, I just randomly appoint somebody. Like, I would be more like I'm hiring somebody. So somebody would apply, somebody would, or, you know, a future clerk would have to apply. They would have to meet the qualifications, the minimum qualifications. There'd be a grading scale. There'd be, you know, so and HR would be involved, like they would be involved in other searches or other for other department heads. So it would be so that just from a capacity standpoint. And I say this as someone who used to be on the city council and used to see <coughs> that when we had to appoint um, the board of health who actually directly supervised the health director and basically ran a department. Um, and it, um, the council just was not, um, it, was, it was completely one of the most political things. Uh, it was naked politics, uh, basically. And so it, it had, didn't really have anything to do with running a city department. And again, I say, that, I say that as a former member of the council, we just, because it's not something, you don't have an HR department, you don't have, and so that was the, I, so that's, and again, the argument then was, well, you can't have the mayor supervise the board of health because health is so important and the mayor might politicize it and the mayor might, and it was just like, the you know, but you could apply that to every every department. You can't have the mayor supervise the police chief because the mayor may you know tell the police chief to break the law or to do something. You know, and you could pretty much use that in every single departmental example. Um, 
And so, you know, eventually we changed the charter and made the, um, you know, the Board of Health advisory and made the, the, the health director report directly to the mayor, like all other department heads. Um, so anyway, I just, I'm saying that from my experience as a former counselor who had people come and complain about the Board of Health um, to the committee that I used to serve on. Um, social, remember it was, was it social services? We were on it together, you, me, and Marilyn Richards, I think. And, but anyway, people would come and complain. We had no authority. The mayor had no authority. Um, it was an independent Board of Health. And uh, so anyway, I, I don't want to go back in that direction. That would just be my concern. And I say that as somebody with, who has great respect for this body. It's just the body's not really set up to do um, those types of hirings for professional staff. It, it's more suited, I think, to do a confirmation role. That's, so that's all. Okay. It, it, yes. it just, it's worth noting that the mayor is invited uh, on many searches, uh, elected officials to serve on those search committees that do the interviewing as well, so. Any other thoughts or questions about this pretty big item? No? Anyone from the committee have anything else they'd like to add on this part? No? No? Okay. Um, let's do a roll call. Shall we? We shall. Yes. 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 That passes, and we are over the bridge. Well done. Well done. You actually killed two of that. Well, one of the big ones and also excising. You did good. Thank you. Five. Yeah. Um, I just want to check in with everyone. How we still have a few items on, you know, these sort of more, yes? If I may, I, I would just say that if we get to 7-6, yeah. which is stuff that's already embedded in the document, um, the remaining sections about elections, uh, we, buy, we pass over elections because that's the big discussion. And then we save that for the next yeah. meeting. Save right, so the election yeah. discussion. Continue with these parts. Yeah, yeah. The, this is the, you know, the electron of the Oliver Smith will is not going to be a big one. Uh, superintendent of, of uh, Smith Agricultural School is also. That's a messy one. <laughs> so let's go. Or that one could be a little trickier. Uh, the, well, okay. I, well, we'll see. And then uh, Forbes. CPA, Forbes. That's right. I, I, I would defer to your decision when we got 930 now. So The next section just corrects sort of an error that was made in the old charter, mm -hmm. which was we basically set up provisions for uh, filling the vacancy of the city clerk, and then we just kind of blanketly applied them to all the other elected positions. And it sort of was a bit of a oversweep because it, right. it basically then didn't treat Smith Voc like a school committee, like mm -hmm. we treat the other school committee, mm -hmm. and it also kind of didn't didn't recognize the independence of the Forbes trustees. So it basically, um, so it, it, it before we basically said the city council appointed the members of a vacancy for the Smith Voc board, um, which is unlike what you do for the school Northampton School Committee. So it, this just sort of aligns it, and then it also for the will of uh, Charles Forbes, the library, um, it basically says that they get to choose their own um, successor. That the council doesn't really have a role in that because they are an independently elected, separate from the city. I can show you the lawsuit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go forward. Yes. Go forward and try and do the rest of these. Yes. 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 I think okay. right up to yeah That's item all. seven six okay. the independent audit. Yeah. So I'm gonna read the new section five dash one trustees <laughs> under the will of Charles E. Forbes. 
Okay, this uh, remains. Five members shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large for a term of four years so arrange that all members are not elected at the same time. This is being deleted. Vacancies shall be filled in a like manner as a city clerk vacancy. What is being added is whenever a vacancy occurs on the Board of Trustees under the will of Charles E. Forbes, the President of the Board shall declare a vacancy and within 30 days following the date of the vacancy shall call a meeting of the trustees to fill the vacancy. The Board of Trustees shall choose a person to fill the vacancy from among the voters entitled to vote for the office. Persons appointed by the trustees to fill a vacancy shall serve only until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. The candidate elected to an office filled by appointment prior to the election shall be sworn to the office immediately and shall serve for the unexpired term of the seat to which such candidate was elected. If the seat to which the candidate was elected would have been on the ballot in the next regular city election, notwithstanding the vacancy, such candidate shall be elected for a full four-year term. No vacancy shall be filled under the section if a person, if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date of the vacancy is declared, uh, if within 100 days following the date of the vacancy is declared to exist. Uh, this is being deleted. Persons appointed by the trustees to fill a vacancy under this section shall not be entitled to have the words, quote, candidate for re-election, unquote, printed with that person's name on the election ballot. Yeah. Uh, I move to uh, add the language recommended. I move to recommend the language. Recommend. All right. Recommend it. <laughs> it's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Second. Yes, I got your second. Excellent. <laughs> uh, um, actually, the mayor laid this out pretty well. Yeah. This really does kind of it, it more clearly defines circumstances and conditions, and of course has the same gobbledygook, we'll call it, uh, about calendars and, and uh, timely elections and everything else. But the whole intent of this is to, as soon as practical, uh, replace these positions with elected people and in the meantime so they don't serve as a vacancy that would be a detriment to the the work of the committees the, there's we provide this means of uh, filling the vacancy until such time that uh, an election can occur and we'll, we'll see this come up under Oliver Smith will of course <coughs> to explain what the Oliver Smith will is for folks who don't know and um, and so forth. Okay, any other questions or discussion on this section? No? Hearing none. All those in favor of recommending these uh, deletions and additions, please. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, but there also is one other addition. Oh, it's the, it's the changing of the, the charter. Right, so. It's 5 1 now instead of section 5. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, changing where it is and the deletions and additions recommending that please say <laughs> aye. Aye. aye aye objections okay moving to what is now section 5-2 which is a change uh elector under the oliver smith will one member shall be elected. This this is, remains. One member shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large for a term of two years. This is deleted. Vacancies shall be filled in a like manner as a city clerk vacancy. Being added is whenever a vacancy occurs in the office of elector under the Oliver Smith will, the city council shall, within 30 days following the date of that vacancy, act to fill the vacancy. A person elected to fill a vacancy by the city council shall serve only until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. The person elected at regular at such regular city election shall take office immediately. No vacancy shall be filled under this section if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date of the vacancy. A person elected as elector under the Oliver Smith will under the section shall not be entitled to have the words quote candidate for re-election printed end quote printed next to the person's name on the election ballot I move to recommend the recommendation I second that and made and seconded I, I can anticipate yeah <laughs> why do Jared, why is that today. why is candidate for re-election there I asked the same question um, do oh, okay so um, There, there is a blanket recommendation that uh, to level the playing field, um, the words candidate for re-election be removed from any incumbent on the ballot. Th that's something that you'll, you'll be 
that's a recommendation you'll be voting on separately. Uh, assuming that that is is approved, um, then you'll, we, we don't need to repeat it under each of these uh, individual um, uh, you know, filling of vacancies, procedures for filling vacancies. But to be consistent, um, in, in case that recommendation is not approved, um, it has been the intent under the current charter that a person who is appointed to fill a vacancy not be noted as a candidate for re-election because in fact he or she has not been elected by the, by the voters. So I would handle uh, I would handle that um, uh, it, it, you know it, it, at this point I think you need to handle it the same uh, under each of these as, as until you actually vote on the blanket recommendation. I, you know it's interesting <coughs> as this kept coming up I was thinking that maybe we should that's actually not a huge thing to deal with and that's one item that we can deal with that would actually we can eliminate all that language and you know those those little amended versions of each one of these um, so essentially one of the questions that will be coming up is to remove the need for the specific reason to receive an absentee ballot no wrong one for remove the designation for candidate for re-election from the names of the incumbents on municipal ballots extending voting rights and then we'll leave it at that because that's the next item so I would actually like to discuss that maybe in the in, in the course of this discussion. So um, we don't have to have the conversation over and over again, and that we don't have to. All those if if it should pass as Stan says, then, then we don't need to include that language in each one of these items. Right, but if it doesn't pass. If it doesn't pass, it stays. It should be. It it, it should the language should stay. The word uh, candidate for re-election, actually, yeah, no, we don't. Then it stays. Right. Then it stays. <coughs> there, even though we're recommending it, be delayed. yes. Um, but then, I mean, I, that's that's perfectly understandable. But we have an inconsistency because we've already recommended to remove it from everything before now. It, 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 that's and that's true, and, and since those we've already agreed on that, I, I'm, I'm going to... Those were for Those were just for appointments. Those were appointments. Uh, they, they wanted that. Well, it was also uh, in the... Vacancy. Vacancies, that's yeah. That's what these are also, is uh, vacancy language. So, but so Council I, Jarrett points out... If you decide you actually want to remove it from actual real incumbents, right. Right. then then you would, it would be a universal change. I think I think what we're talking about is um, the designation you have incumbents or actually just remove the designation of candidate for re-election, period. Would probably cover the whole shooting match. Sure which is a vacancy fulfillment. And right. Isn't that a recommendation? Yeah. Yeah. But that's a recommendation under election procedures. Right. right. I could suggest, I think, <coughs> Councilor Dwight's suggestion that you take that up first would, would right. be a cleaner way of, of handling this. Exactly. And just that one item in the in the election discussion, but that one item in the election discussion would be appropriate now, given the fact that we keep running into this. Okay. And it comes up with vacancies and also special elections. So are you going to withdraw your motion? Sure am. Okay. Okay. Moving to, it's not, oh, well, it's not in, there's nowhere to move to, right? Right. It's not actually in the body of right. this now. It's, it is, what, that is one of the recommendations that's not currently standing in the charter. Okay. So I'm not going to read anything, but we're going to reiterate that uh, we're going to, we're looking for a motion to open the discussion on whether removing the designation candidate for re-election, or yeah, candidate for re-election from the names of incumbents on municipal ballots. Vacancies. And vacancies. All use, I, actually, I would I would move that to recommend that removing all terms that refer to candidates for re-election on the ballots. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. 
Okay, now let's discuss it. Councilor LaBarge, what's your uh, question? It's not about remove all terms. Remove, remove the term. The term. Candidate for re-election from the ballots in all circumstances in, in, in the charter as it stands. All references to that term. And, and, and by the way, if I'll just state the, the reason for this actually is, as Stan said, it's to level the playing field. There is a presumption, there's granting a certain gravitas to a candidate, or the assumption is you're granting gravitas to a candidate by pointing out that they're an incumbent. And that, that would, they would enjoy a special uh, advantage in the, in, on the ballot. Particularly if no one knows either candidate and they just go to a default and go, all right, they're already in there. I, life's fine. I'll vote for them. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> in, a, in this circumstance, it, it actually makes sense. I, I, think like it's, it. I think it's an unfair advantage and I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, just uh, also a disadvantage. Can you come? Uh, yeah. 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 Come That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's it. It could present an advantage or a disadvantage, so leveling the playing field so there's no bias one way or another. Makes sense. Good point. Anti-incumbent yeah. fervor, you know, sweeps. Right. For me, it served as a distinct disadvantage, yes. <laughs> um, I feel like there was, or how are you all doing over there? I feel like there was a lot of looking at papers and the, the former committee. Anyone want to weigh in on anything? No? Um, yeah. Well, they're just catching up to where we were. We've now moved okay. from the, yeah. yeah, they're just catching up on the document. That's all. Okay. Um, counselors. Oh, fine. I see two thought bubbles. I'm going to go with hand. counselor, yes, counselor <laughs> Nash, and then. I'm going to get this discussion going. I think this is a good idea. We should do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you for weighing in. Aaron Arquist, did you want to add something? No, no, no. So this, this is just going to require, this is going to be one of those ones that the solicitor is going to have to draft something. Right. Because we're specifically s exempting ourselves from state law because under state law, incumbents have that on the ballot. Like it's, it's sort of under state election law. So that's so, but that's fine. We can do that. So this is going to be one that he'll just have to create language right. this will, in this the election part of the order, yeah. and bring something back to you. To Since we need agreement between both of our, both branches, are you agreeing? I, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Any any other thoughts or comments? Maybe in capacity. <laughs> 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 we'll agree for you. Um, okay. Uh, remind me what this motion was. All those again, Yugi, all those who were in favor of removing the term candidate for re-election on post on city ballots. Well, it's just not on vacancies, it's just on ballots. Just on ballots, okay. It would occur. Uh, anyone, would anyone like a voice, would like anyone like a roll call on this? Yes. Oh, Councilor LaBarge would like a roll call, please. Thank you. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. And Councilor Jarrett. Yes. That, yes. That uh, passes. Our recommendation passes. Um, and the solicitor will work on language for that. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go back to section 5-2. Elector under the Oliver Smith will, which I've already read and will not torture you with reading again. Um, we need, we need. I think you have to approve. Did you already approve? Did you already excise it from five dash one? Because you approved five dash one. We did excise it you from. Did, it, that yeah. was excised from five dash one, fortunately. <laughs> um, okay, so five dash two. We need a new motion. Because that one had been. Um, okay, so I, I, I move that we recommend the deletion of vacancies shall be filed in the like manner as the city, uh, city clerk vacancy. 
and then add all the new language with the but in the recommendation delete um, the last sentence a person serving as elector under the Alvaro Smith well under the section shall not be entitled to have the words candidate for re-election printed that next to that person's name on the election ballot. That's a motion. Second. And it's been seconded. Oh, okay. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, so with this position here, it's an elected position, so say she's on it. She's been on it for five years, six years, whatever. So that would also not have an incumbent name on it. Right. Correct. Doesn't matter how long you are an incumbent. Okay. You're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi. Councilor Mayori. Um, okay. <laughs> Councilor Foster, we're getting loopy. Okay. <laughs> Just a question. Yeah. Um, if the city council is responsible for filling the vacancy within 30 days, mm -hmm. is the process for doing that spelled out by ordinance? Okay. Or how would we do that? Um, uh, anyone ready to help me out here? <coughs> Councilor Dwight deserted me. No, it would just you would be. Yeah, you you could add something <coughs> for the school committee. Right. Um, but would that be your recommendation? I mean, you could also. Have, um, yeah. You could also just amend 4 6, that new sentence in 4 6, and just say mm -hmm. um, the process of procedures by which the city council and school committee shall jointly, or you could say by which the city council or the city council and school committee jointly shall fill vacancies shall be established by ordinance. So that way you can create one ordinance for dealing with any type of vacancy either the combined or the solo, <coughs> rather than having to put that in every section. Right. Did the committee discuss, whoa, did the committee discuss at all how we, we would? We did not. Um, uh, uh, and in this case, um, there is no other body that the city council <coughs> would be working in concert with. Right. It would be the city council mm -hmm. alone that would act to fill that vacancy. So, um, but I think it, it does make sense to yeah. simply say that the, the process will be established by, by ordinance. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Councilor Dwight, do you agree? I do agree. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, to that point, um, would you like to amend the motion or? I didn't mean to Maybe. put you on the spot. Um, we can, yeah, but I, I would recommend we? that there be that we, by, or yeah, that we add by ordinance mm. to be developed something cleaner <coughs> than that. But um, the, yeah, that it would be filled so by fill, ordinance. Uh, the process and procedures by which the city council shall shall fill vacancies under the section shall be established by ordinance. That that's it. Okay. Yes. yes. She's good. We are, we're adding, so yes, okay. um, but we're like adding wording cribbing from 4-6, okay. but changing, this is joint between school committee and city council. We're just having it be from city council. Okay. Um, uh, I've lost my place. Is that a, we need to do a separate... It's more of than a I, I missed what was We're that, adding was that, that a, a motion? Did no. Councilor Foster make a motion? I wasn't here. Yes. Did I? Or a recommendation? <laughs> <laughs> or a recommendation? You can call I, it. I, okay, I'll make it a motion. Okay. I'll second yes. it. Thank you. There you go. Okay. okay. Just with caution, you, is it, I, where, where were you putting it? Were you putting it in, in um, five? Five dash two. Five dash. Last sentence of yep. five dash mm -hmm. two. Five dash. So you're just going to do one at the end of every section, right? Looks like. Okay. Five dash three. Because four dash six, it was only referring to the ones under that section. So right. yeah, you would have to just right. basically do the same language. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jarrett. 
Um, the there's also language do we, um, in four four dash six that says sh shall appoint by majority vote of those present. Mm -hmm. Is that language we also want to copy? So instead, um, so it would say, whenever a vacancy occurs in the office of the elector under the Oliver Smith will, the city council shall within 30 days following the date of that vacancy appoint by majority vote of those present a replacement. Um, I would say that do similar to what we're going to do in 5-3, just to say shall be filled in like manner as the school committee uh -huh. vacancy. And, uh, and then add the language oh. that Councilor Foster has just amended. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that keeps everything consistent that way. So rather than repeat it each time, we just refer to that the way uh, the way we handle the election in the school committee. Say we're with the same way we're going to handle the election and the superintendents under uh, Smith Agricultural School. Although, actually, I take it back. It's, it's because it requires <laughs> school committee members to be in attendance as well. So, uh, yeah. So where it talks about the majority present with school committee and city council it's filling a vacancy on school committee so the question was brought by a school committee member not the total members because someone's vacant right like a, there's a spot missing mm -hmm. so that's what that language was for but gotcha. the elector under this is that where we are, are we under no. Yeah, yeah, under yeah. under the Oliver Smith well, it's one person and you guys would be doing it. Yeah. So it's not like the school. Gotcha. Right. right. So yeah. we don't want to copy that language. That was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Jarrett, could you are you still I have one more proposed change. So I don't Have know it. how that but works. Oh, wait, this so is still got this. Oh, so should we, we should Hold finish it. this and then do another yeah. amendment. Yeah. Is that the process? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any further discussion on that amendment? No. Okay, all those in favor of that amendment, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Councilor Jarrett. Um, it says a person elected to fill a vacancy by the city council, should that become appointed, similar to the others? Yep. Consistency. Mm -hmm. Yep. So is that a motion? Yes. Uh, Second. Make a motion in oh, okay yeah <laughs> um so that's been change it twice though because the original language says elected to the, the right it says one member there's two so references to elected yeah. there mm-hmm yep oh no i'm sorry that no, that's, no. That's, that's actually, actually is elected. That's actually correct that's they, they are yeah. elected yeah. 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 Sorry, my bad. so no the, that one's fine yeah. the first elected is fine that one's fine don't change that Second elected, as Councilor Jarrett points out, the person elected uh, under under by the council is not elected. We'll call them appointed. Okay. Yes. The first, which is the first, which is elected. the first one. Right, the first one. Needs yeah, to the first one's not fine. That's the one you want to change. Oh no no! Wait, no. Oh, Councilor Dwight's right. The the first sentence, which is not up for change at all, right. says elected. Oh, yeah. that. So it is the second one. reference to elected. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, that's an amendment. <coughs> if we need a motion. I, okay, I'm gonna pull it together. All those in favor of that amendment? Aye. Aye. Uh, I seconded. Uh, Councilor Jarrett made the recommendation and okay. I second. All right. Any further discussion on this section? Seeing none, all those in favor of recommending these uh, changes, please say aye. 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 Objections? Okay. We are now moving to section, what is now section 5-3, superintendents of Smith. We are 
no longer making it possessive. Apostrophe S is coming off. Agricultural school. Um, three members shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large for a term of two years. Vacancies shall be filled in a like manner as a, this in it is what's being added, school committee. City clerk is being deleted. Vacancy. Um, I believe that we should also include the same language by which the city uh, shall jointly fill vacancies <coughs> under this section shall be established by ordinance. Well, I don't think anyone's Sorry. made a motion. Because it's already in the other section that you right. say you're going to follow. Okay, so that would apply. Okay. But we Good enough. We do need a motion. Make that motion. And made. Second. And seconded. Okay, so okay. <laughs> as is written here, which is change to section 5-3, uh, adding school committee, taking out city clerk, and also it is no longer possessive Smiths, it is just Smith, mm -hmm. agricultural school. Any discussion? Oh. So this says we're going to handle this in the same manner as the school committee, but with the, so there's three members of this body, would the other two be invited to vote? Uh, is that more clear than I think it is? Um, yeah, that, I mean, the, because this makes, to me, makes it sound like the school committee and the city council will pick the next person. It doesn't look like it includes yeah, the Smith, to the other two Smith folk trustees. Well, indicating that the Smith vocational and architectural, yeah. uh, I, I mean, there's three of them. School. If one steps down, uh, the other two would be involved in this yeah. choosing of their third of member. the other trustees. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how we do that. That's how we do it. The other oddity here is that Smith Oak is actually in our charter had various iterations of its name, various changes. Right. We settled on Smith Agricultural School because that's what was in the original charter. Um, vocational wasn't included in that, so but it, it become that it come up the for discussion as to mm -hmm. The official final designation of what the school's name is. This was actually a, an issue that came up because when we did the new charter, we accidentally got rid of the way that it used to be done, which was the city council and the two remaining uh, trustees appointed the vacancy. And then we inadvertently, just because we used boilerplate, said you do it like the city clerk, mm -hmm. uh, which is just the city council. So this is actually one the Smith trustees brought forward because they're like, you, you, you basically left us out of the process when you read the charter. So this would bring it back to it. So it would be a joint meeting of the city council and the school committee, but in this case, it would be the board of trustees uh, would be that school committee for purposes okay. of filling this, that vacancy. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. And I mean, that, to me, that confuses me um, because when I say in like manner as a school committee vacancy, I look literally to how is that filled, and it says city council and school committee. Um, although Smith Agricultural School trustees are a school committee. Mm -hmm. You read it as the Northampton Public School Committee. Right, so that's, if the city solicitor feels there's no confusion there, and le legally I, I would be fine with that, um, but that's, to me, that feels confusing and there, Maybe should be some language that says, uh, as a school committee vacancy, but with the trustees in the place of the school. The, dis the difference is that the trustees, as opposed to school committee members, at Smith. So all references to them would be as trustees, and then when referring to school committee, it's, it should be clear that committee members, which I believe they now have a new appellation or a new moniker for members. their members. members. Got it. So school committee members would be, um, that, that clearly indicates NPS, I think, at least that should be, is, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. I thought, is, 
Were you confused about making the distinction between the two when making this rule? Okay, clarify what is that it actually means. Because uh, you're saying that those who would vote would be the city council and superintendents. The two remaining superintendents. Right. Because it says in a like manner as mm -hmm. the school committee. Yeah. So basically you would take the remaining members of the school committee and the city council, they would meet together and fill the vacancy. It doesn't say exactly like, the, you know, or, or that you will mm -hmm. follow the same procedure. It says in a like manner. So it's sort of like use the same model. Um, this was just so that you wouldn't have to spell out the <coughs> exact same language that could, but this was just a way to save time and acknowledge that they're just like a school, that they are a school committee, effectively. Right. But they just have a different appellation. Right. They're, they're not members. Yeah. Yeah. Handle. Yes. Um, are you, are you council on that? Yeah, if the city solicitor finds it, to, if the city is comfortable with that, then yes. Okay. Any other discussion on this section hearing none all those in favor of these uh, changes of recommending these changes please say aye aye, aye. aye. objections nope. okay so that brings us to what is now section 5-4 community preservation committee Two, this means two members shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large for a term of four years this is being deleted. Vacancies shall be filled in a like manner as a city clerk vacancy. This is being added. Whenever a vacancy occurs on the Community Preservation Committee, the City Council shall, within 30 days following the date of that vacancy, act to fill the vacancy. A person elected to fill a vacancy by the City Council shall serve only until the next regular city election when the office shall be filled by the voters. The person elected at such regular city election shall take office immediately. No vacancy shall be filled under this section if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date of the vacancy. A person serving as a member of the Community Preservation Committee under this section shall not be entitled to have the words, quote, no. candidate for re-election printed next to that person's name on the election ballot. I move to forward the recommendation <coughs> along with the deletion of the last sentence. A person serving the Preservation Committee shall not be entitled to have the candidate uh, for re-election printed next to that person's name on the ballot. That is a motion that's been made second and seconded by Councilor Mayori. Discussion. I think also we need to change the elected to appointed the yeah. first yeah. word on this page. Okay. Um, and then do we also need to say something about in a like manner as the um, elector under the Oliver Smith will that we'd fill it in the like manner? Right process to be defined. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, we actually could do that instead of, in fact, what we do is we state all the conditions that were the same as the Oliver Smith will. Mm -hmm. we, we could instead just say, in the like manner, the trustees the Oliver Smith will. The only thing that would concern me is that I. <clears throat> if we change that. Yeah, no, I don't have a problem with that. I think that. that so if that's the preference, I think that that would save future council presidents from having to read out the whole thing all over again. So, um, so actually I would amend it to say essentially to delete whatever vac uh, to, to basically delete vacancy shall be uh, found in like minutes city clerk vacancy and then add whenever vacancy occurs in the community preservation committee uh, the replacement shall be done in like manner. How does that read? Uh, as the Oliver Smith will. We do it like the Smith one below it. That's because of what you're saying. Right, right so exactly. <laughs> so actually, you would resuscitate the old language that's being crossed out right. and just say in a like manner as um, the Oliver Smith. Yeah, the trustees Oliver under the Oliver Smith will. Yeah. And then delete everything else. You okay, Laura? 
Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 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 amend. I'll read the whole order as it should be, or as we're recommending. Uh, two members shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large for a term of four years. That remains. Whenever a vacancy occurs on the Community Preservation Committee, uh, the BDPD shall be filled in a like manner. A uh, vacancy shall be actually just vacancy shall be filled in a like manner as the, a vacancy <coughs> trustees under the will of Charles E. Forbes or no Oliver Smith will. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much, that was really so much clearer. Um, could I actually just make a recommendation on this one? I know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. but I feel like these are diff such different bodies. Like the, I feel like the CPC is like a governmental mm -hmm. body with, or you know, it's a body within the city that makes decisions relative to the city. And the Oliver Smith is like nobody knows what it is really, but it's this external body that's made up of all these different towns, and nobody really. I just feel like. It's almost worth keeping the language in for CPC and not referencing the other one. Just I think in this case it might be better to have more. More is better. I just that's sort of my thought as I think about it further. I know why you're yeah. doing it for simplicity, but I just think ref referring the CPC to this one, I'd almost rather you flip it and have clear procedures spelled out for the CPC, which most people know about, um, and nobody really knows what the other one does. So I just either reverse them or leave it the way it is. That would just be my preference. Thinking for future citizens who want to look at this, um, and somebody on the CPC resigns, and then it's it just feels like you'd want to have really clear procedures spelled out for that. Yeah. I would agree with that. OK. okay. So that's, um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I withdraw the motion. I withdraw the motion, and I would make the new motion, of course, keeping the existing language with the deletion and, and modifying the, the term elected to appointed. Uh, which, which elected, though? Let me make the, sure. The person appointed to fill a vacancy. Right, thank you. Uh, it's at the top of the page. It's the very first word at the top of the page to be changed from elected to to, uh, to appointed, and then also delete the last line about candidate for re-election. That's so. That's my new motion. Okay. Do you want an ordinance yeah. too, or not? Exactly. Do you want to add the yeah. ordinance? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Else? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Amended. Uh, shall be. <laughs> Uh, what's the term? Process shall be established by ordinance. Oh, what is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The process That's and correct. procedures by which the city council shall fill, fill vacancies under the section shall be established by ordinance. It's basically the end of 4 6. But okay. Yeah, end of 4 6. Okay. Did we have a second? We don't have a second. Second. Okay. That's one second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any dis more further discussion on this? No. Are we comfortable voting on this? All right. Yeah, well, let's make sure the mayor. Are you, you comfortable with that? Can we vote on this? Sure. Okay. I just didn't know if you were still conferring about it. Um, all those in favor of recommending those uh, changes? Make a motion. Aye. Oh, I please would. say aye. 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 Objections? No. Okay. Almost there. Okay, so we're in route 7 2. Yep. We are moving to section 7 2 annual budget policy. <laughs> Uh, the mayor shall call a joint meeting of the city council, comma, is being added and is being deleted, school committee, so city council, comma, school committee, including the superintendent of schools, and this is being added, and Smith Agricultural School trustees, 
before the commencement of the budget process to review the financial condition of the city revenue and expenditure forecast and other relevant information prepared by the mayor in order to develop a coordinated budget. I move to approve the record. I second, second that one. It's been made and seconded. Discussion, yes. Why are they called trustees in some places and superintendents in others? That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That was a deep sigh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I wish they would just change it to trustees. Honestly, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't actually. Know. Because there is a superintendent as well. There, there, there is an actual right. superintendent, and then there's these guys are either the superintendents or are they Smith Vocational Agricultural School, or are they Smith Vocational School, or are they Smith Agricultural. School? This is what I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to the solicitor about because the um, the that attachment one that, that right. we're deleting that's where like the superintendents of Smith school I mean, there's the will but then there was a law that actually sort of superseded the will and created the modern structure so we could look at that because it's always bugged me that they call it the superintendents of mm -hmm. Smith's agricultural school um, so we can look into whether that is something that could be modified because okay. today they're called Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, right. and they are the trust board of trustees. Mm -hmm. right. They're not superintendents; they're the board of trustees. So let me look into that. Okay. Because that's uh, in, like at all the meetings on our stationery on right. our letterhead. Uh, you know, it's, mm. it's trustee. I am a trustee. So, um, so let me let me. I'll ask the city solicitor to research that because it is an, it is a weird inconsistency, and even on the ballots when people look at it, it doesn't make sense because they're you know so. We can look into that. That would be one of those things would be great to just get the text So one that says here the superintendent of schools, that's referring to Northampton Public, Public School. Yes. Do we have to you said they also have a super Smith also a superintendent. So do we need to include the superintendent we should. here We're as in well? A really big table, but yes we should. Uh, superintendent. We should include the superintendent as well. Okay. Which is a modern incarnation as well, because they they've only had three or four superintendents. They used to have directors, and then they changed and called it superintendent. So, so should we <laughs> should we add uh, Smith Agricultural School trustees, comma, and the superintendent of, or just and and the Smith Agricultural School Superintendent? I would say including the superintendent, including the superintendent. Of Smith Agricultural School. And, and do we need to define that's, the other as the superintendent of the public school? Yes, one. And I don't. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Do you feel like we need to then make clear that this, the the first superintendent is of the Northampton Public School. You know what? You could say superintendents of schools, of both schools, mm -hmm. districts. And Does that make sense when you haven't yet mentioned the Smith Agricultural School? Well, what I might have to bump them or is, um, move that after. Um, uh, <coughs> I would say maybe reverse the order and say the city council, school committee, um, whatever we're going to call the trustees, um, and then say, and the superintendents of those two schools, mm -hmm. or those two districts. districts. Um, that would be the clearest way to, yeah. to do it. Um, and I agree that Smith Agricultural School trustees is sort of awkward. Um, I mean, it just doesn't jive with what's in the rest of the document. But it's not even the name of the school, so. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the other problem, or at least the name that most people in the public know it as. So we need some clarification on that one. Okay. So, um, well, actually, how about this? We so, I recommend the language the mayor just proposed with also uh, an understanding this will be forward to the <coughs> solicitor to finalize the definitions and terms related to Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. S B A H S A H S. Um, terms and. Once we get that settled, the, but the, I like the order that the mayor described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would, Laura it would read, a mayor shall call a joint meeting of the city council, comma, uh, school committee, and uh, school committee, comma, Smith Agricultural School trustees, and including the superintendents of both districts. 
before the commencement of the budget process by Bodak. Okay. So that is that a new motion? That's yeah, we'll call it a new motion. Okay, is there a second on that one? Second. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been made and seconded. Discussion to that <coughs> changes. Okay, all <laughs> um, all those in favor of the re those that recommendation, please say aye. 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 Okay. Got the last one. Okay. Which is <laughs> oh teeny tiny. Okay. <laughs> Seven. So this is the last one we're going to do today, and then we will. I mean, there's like that, none of this stuff we're going to do? No. Okay. No. Uh, the last one we're going to do today, and then we will take this up at another meeting, the rest of it. Um, okay, so this is section 7 6, independent audit. Uh, this remains until I tell you the new thing. The City Council shall annually provide for an outside audit of the books and accounts of the City to be conducted by a certified public accountant or a firm of certified public accountants, which has no personal interest, direct or indirect, in the fiscal affairs of the City or any of its officers. The Mayor shall annually provide to the City Council a sum of money sufficient to satisfy the estimated cost of conducting the audit as presented to the Mayor in writing by the City Council. The award of a, this is being added, three year three years being added, contract to audit shall be made by the City Council on or before September 15th, September 15th of each year. The clerk of the council shall coordinate the work of the individual or firm selected. The report of the audit shall be filed in final form of the City Council not later than March 1 in the year following its award. I move to forward the recommendation. Second, second that. It's made and seconded. The purpose is, this is actually best practices. It's. Um, it allows an audit firm to analyze. Now, an audit report is not, as a rule, exhaustive. It focuses on larger segments of uh, a city's budget and financial records. Three years gives it an opportunity for a deeper dive and a wider view. Now, fortunately, we've had um, an auditor who actually knows us pretty well, uh, Scanlon. But the fact is, the, the hope here was that the contract, rather than being reviewed annually and giving granting for three years, gives auditors an opportunity to do, be more analytical and have a contextual uh, uh, perspective of the, of the city's finances. And after three years, a uh, new contract should be considered. Also worth noting is there's not a whole lot of auditors out there when we do RFPs. There's, I think the last time we did it, we only had two bids. Um, but it is always good to have fresh eyes. After three years, it would make sense to have a different audit firm, possibly, review the, and, uh, review the finances and maybe see things that the other audit firm did not. So, but three years, is a best practice recommendation, so. Any other comments, Councilor Jarrett? How can you award a three-year contract each year? That's what I was wondering. Yep, good question. That's right. I think it delete the each year at the end of that sentence. Catch. Yes. So it now ends with on or before September, September 15th. 15th. But the problem is September 15th happens each year. Good so point. <laughs> I think uh, September 15th of, I think you have to contract say contract year. years. Or something. Just say every three years. On or before. On or before September 15th, every three years. Every three years, yeah. That would be the easier. Yeah. Because yeah. just saying September right. 15th, you'd have the same problem. Right. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? Contract to three years. All those in favor of that uh, addition, please say aye. 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 Excellent. Okay, so we are. Go oh, there's two really tiny things just to close out the housekeeping. Sure. Okay. They're really small. I promise. Oh yeah. Eight one and ten seven. Eight one. We do all the housekeeping. Oh yes. Look at how tiny it takes care of. Eight one and eight two. It looks like. 
Same change in 81 and 82? Yes. Okay. So that a Yes. So section 8-1 preliminary elections. Um, the third line still the first well, sentence. If I may, yes? actually this would probably be addressed in the, our request of the solicitor to finally determine what the hell Smith book is going to be called. <laughs> Okay. And that we can delete the apostrophe S at that point, and in all reference to it, the and the, place. yeah, depending on the officer's uh, <laughs> recommendation, those can be changed. Okay, so rather than have you force you to read all these things just to get rid of the no. apostrophe S, a possessive, in a term we may not end up using. So. Okay, but ten seven we're going to skip to. Uh, so we're going to skip to ten seven real quick. Uniform procedures governing multi-member bodies. I like this one. A, meetings. All appointed multi-member bodies in the city shall meet regularly at the times and places of the multi-member body by the body's own rules prescribed. Special meetings of any multi-member body shall be held on the call of the chair. Man is being removed <coughs> yes. or by a majority of the members of the body. Notice the meeting shall be posted as required by law, except as may otherwise be authorized by law. All meetings of multi-member body shall at all times be open to the public. I move forward to the recommended deletion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Eight and second. And it should be noted, every, the, all gender specific language has been deleted from every document that we had here and this, oh. this was the yeah. one that stuck out. This one survived somehow like <laughs> Some a little roach or something. But anyway, uh -oh. so this is, this is a, <laughs> the last gender term in this charter as far as I can tell. All those in favor of removing the last gender term in this charter as far as Councilor Dwight can tell. Please say aye. 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 Okay. So now we're going to put this aside um, to the members of the former committee. Thank you. Thank you for your service all along, but thank you for sitting here with us, empowering through this with us. We're deeply indebted. Um, no, we're not done. I don't know. We've got the big stuff coming. So. Yeah, we would, we would love it if you would join us again in the future when we take up the rest, but thank you for um, being here with us tonight. Well, do you anticipate taking up the rest on March 19th? Um, I guess that's a question maybe that the solicitor needs to be involved with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Meaning, would you like draft language before <clears throat> or something to look at for some of these other recommendations? Right. I mean, I guess that's the question whether how we want to proceed in terms of coming up with language, whether we'll just ask the solicitor to give us language that we'll then discuss, or whether we want to work. We, we can request the solicitor be at the next meeting. That's possible. I, still, I just wouldn't want you to try to draft language no. at a meeting. So. No, no, I, I know, but I think having him keep a pace, there's some questions he could have answered tonight that would have been helpful. I think it, it would be appropriate to have trust. But the question still stands whether we want to ask for all that language by the 19th. If he feels comfortable, I, I got the sense in his letter to me that, or his phone I think call would be. He was hoping that you would make policy level decisions exactly. and say, yeah, we want to do that, draft us some language, versus him drafting a bunch of language and then you say, right. that's, that's what I was saying. So, I, 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 my sense from him was he would prefer that we actually vote on the essence of each article okay. before he drafts okay. the final order. So, but which <laughs> for why it would be helpful to have him here so he could hear the debate and understand what it was. So that would be my request is that the okay. solicitor be present at the next meeting that we have. Okay. Um, so so you let us know and speak for myself. I, I will certainly be here at whatever the next meeting is that um, you take up the larger items. Sam is always here. I will let the other committee members know so they can attend if they want. I do want to speak on behalf of the committee and thank you for your close reading of, uh, of our work. It, it is, and you also you handled it in about two and a half hours. It took us months. But, you know, <laughs> we, we, we appreciate the, uh, the, the speedy resolution. <laughs> thank you. OK. So we. Yes. Oh, yes. I would like a recess. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, we are recessed for five minutes. All right. Okay. We are now back from recess, but we are going to go right into recess for the Committee on Finance.
Um, so I don't have a agenda, so I'm just going to do this real quick. Not very good. Um, so Laura, will you please call the roll of finance? Councillor Shera. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Here. Okay, we're all here. Um, the only item on our agenda is the approval of minutes from February 20th, 2020. Move to approve. Second. Seconded. Any discussion on these minutes? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Okay. Um, there's nothing. No new business, so we need a make a motion to adjourn. Nicely done. Second. Motion to be made and seconded. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. Okay, we are now back into <laughs> um and we have, as you we just saw, no financial orders on first reading. So we are gonna move right to financial orders on second reading. So this is 20.025, an order to adjust income limits for uh, senior tax referral program. It's on second reading. Second. Second. Made and seconded by Councilor Quinlan. Um, any further discussion on this order? None. All those in favor? Oh, oh. sorry. Roll um. Yep, sorry, discussion, yes. Sorry, the um, mayor, I think we all saw the, the mayor responded to my question from the last uh, meeting saying that the city council sets uh, the interest rate uh, and it was set in 2006. And um, you know, the mayor recommended that we wait a year uh, at least before considering an adjustment to that rate um, given that we're making a ch big change now and we don't know how many people uh, would be taking it on. So I'm also in agreement with that. Thank you for getting us that information. Any other discussion? No? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councilor Mayori? <coughs> yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Thora? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Foster? Yes. Councilor Jarrett? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Okay, <laughs> passes in second reading. Uh, moving to 20.026, an order to accept DA Sullivan $10,000 gift for digital display and presentation system. Motion's second. been made and seconded by Councilor Nash. Any discussion on this order? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Um, moving on to 20.027, an order to grant easement to National Grid in conjunction with WWTP upgrades, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Motion approved. Motion's been made okay. and seconded by Councilor Foster. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. That passes in second reading. 20.028, an order authorizing acquisition of easements for the laying out of Finn Street as a public way. Move to approve. Second. Made and seconded. Any Discussion. Is that Councilor Quinlan? Uh, Councilor Nash. Councilor Nash. Uh, no discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. That passes in second reading. Twenty point zero two nine. An order authorizing acquisition of easements for the laying out of North Street as a public way. Motion's been made. Second. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. <laughs> Any discussion on this order? Hearing none. Roll call, please. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinn. 
Yes. That passes in second. <laughs> Moving on to ordinances in second reading. 19.125, an ordinance related to wireless antennas on street poles. Move approval. Made and seconded by Councilman <coughs> Large. Um, discussion on this. I know there are there is discussion on this. Are possible changes? Possible changes. <coughs> in Wi-Fi just crapped. <coughs> oh, here, do you, oh. I got it. I'll have it in a second. But Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Okay. Uh, why don't I read the changes? Um, the amendment uh, first. Um, in the first paragraph, um, an, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, um, it, there's, we want to, where it says, an amending section 350-10 dot, removing 9 and 11 dot 4. Is that correct? So that's a little um, accident there. It should, 10.9 should remain, just end 11. .4. Okay. So, and amending section 350-10.9, and then striking and 11.4. So that's just a Scrivener's error, um, because that section is no longer referenced, 11.4. It was, I think, in a previous version. And uh, then <coughs> section F, um, <clears throat> the provider shall restore, and so this is uh, what is currently the language that's currently there. The provider shall restore any damage to the rights of way stemming from installation, maintenance, and then striking and, adding a comma, repair, and then adding comma, or removal of the related infrastructure, including damage to public shade trees, sidewalks, curbs, or other elements. Um, so that, in that section, the purpose is just that in the removal of these uh, antennas, um, if there was any damage in that process, that that would also be um, mm. taking restored. And then adding section G, providers shall post a performance bond with the city that covers the cost of removal and restoration of sites where equipment is no longer being utilized. So do we propose this amendment? We can propose them all as uh, we can do them one at a time, although I would recommend that we just propose all the amendments as as advanced in this in this document. Once okay. the Scrivener error and then um, as you said in item F adding or removal and then also establishing section G related to the performance bond just move them as a whole. Second. Okay, so, so, any discussion to these amendments? Yes. Just speak to the. the uh, you'll recall, Council Jarrett brought up some concerns, and, <coughs> and I shared them about to what extent <laughs> our authority is allowed to go to at least have some aspect or nature, or at least illusion of control over something that uh, the FCC has essentially made. They fast-tracked on approval that's required. That really limits on what we can do. And then they are um, very limiting on what strictures you can apply. But these were kind of important. We read this. We read a number of documents from other communities, California. The Belmont document, uh, Belmont did some very deep research on this. but our, the concerns were more about the city being held harmless ultimately is what we can do in the event that the, the this equipment should actually, we should realize any damage or associated damage. We don't want to end up having to pay for it and at the same time we don't want citizens to also be um, um, subjected to or property being subjected to harm that wouldn't be uh, at least we would make terms that would require them to uh, make everyone whole. And that, unfortunately, was it, right? I mean, essentially, we, <laughs> it was, uh, we had, we had uh, uh, a long talk with Carolyn Mish about this as well. Um, and I also learned in the, the process of this that um, 
the likelihood of us being infested by too much 5G systems is low at this point. We're not what you'd be considered an ideal community for targeting. These things are being way overhyped as to their ability. They can't penetrate walls. They can't penetrate curtains or leaves, for that matter. Um, they're very narrow band radio frequency that doesn't even carry too far. About a thousand feet is the maximum. And so, what they would have in order to build in this community, they would literally have to saturate the, the city with uh, multiple towers, I mean, multiple facilities on that they describe the size of pizza boxes. They, in some cases, they forget to mention those. Pizza boxes are actually cubes that look like dorm refrigerators in some cases. So the ability is overhyped, but that's, of course, certainly not going to stop them from trying to move on this. And they much prefer areas like Boston, obviously, and Chicago and Los Angeles and things like that. Um, right now, all they're really doing is effectively broadcasting to people in large stadiums because they're all concentrated. There's no obstructed line of view. And they can sell their 5G contracts to their phone uh, their phone holders but we do have to have some law we have to have something in place because right now there are three four five G towers I think Carolyn said there's one by the now get this this is if you can figure out where they're going with this they're targeted one at Smith one at the high school one at the middle school and the purpose is small concentrated groups of potential future consumers basically yeah. So, I, you know, so we are dealing with a necessary evil, I guess, and this is the modifications that we're proposing. <coughs> okay. Yes, Councilor Jarrett. Um, so, yeah, you know, we met with Carol and Mish. We, we went over a whole bunch of different possibilities looking with other communities have done, and um, I think we, we came to a place where at this point we didn't feel any confidence in legally regulating the distance that they could be apart. Um, that's what some other communities have done. Um, or there's another community that limited uh, so that it would not be allowed within 500 feet of a home or school, which sounds, uh, if you're trying to regulate on the basis of health that and emissions, that sounds very reasonable, but that's not at a basis that we're allowed to regulate on. And I'm a little unclear as to how they're claiming in these other communities that that there is a basis there. So um, it, I think we could still do more research and uh, talk, you know, there are law firms that, are, that actually specialize in um, helping communities through this process. And so there's, there's potentially more information that we could gather. But at this point, the only thing that we felt confident on was to require that removal element and the, the performance bond so that we're not leaving the city with a mess to clean up. Um, and the performance bond would make sure that it was cleaned up in a timely fashion by them or us. Um, regarding the performance bonds, the city solicitor commented um, on our proposal here amendment and asked who would decide on the performance bond. And Carolyn Mish uh, said, um, uh, I'd say that stays in the regulations. We do this as part of subdivision at the staff, staff level most of the time. It is also part of uh, photovoltaic installation for ground mount systems. The application would state that information regarding the cost for deconstruction slash decommissioning or removal um, of the item. Okay, that must be submitted. The bond must be set for this decommissioning estimate plus inflation plus contingency, usually 10 to 20 percent. Um, so we're passing an ordinance, and as it states in the ordinance, the I believe it says the DPW in consultation with the Office of Planning and Sustainability um, and Department of Central Services um, will promulgate regulations. So those regulations will have more detail. And they, of course, they have to be in compliance with the ordinance, but they can have uh, do more than the ordinance says. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Dwight, thank you for your due diligence around this. 
um, that, that your deeper dive really, I mean, it's been really confusing, this whole thing, is we're trying to regulate something we don't know what it is, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so thank you for the extra work and time that you both put into this. Really appreciate it. Other comments? Ditto. Right. Tina? <laughs> right. Thank you. I, I feel reassured that we've kind of pushed this as far as we can right now. And of course, we can, as the technology progresses and circumstances evolve, we can revisit this, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Especially, uh, yeah. I really appreciate the work you And who knows, with the possible change in federal government, the FCC might not have the free reign that they do at this point. It might be a little more considerate of municipal exposures and concerns, but right now that's not the case. Other comments? Okay, hearing none. Uh, roll call. Did we vote on the amendment? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we haven't voted on the amendment, so. Okay, so all <coughs> in favor of this amended language, please say aye. 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 Now, roll call, please. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? <coughs> Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Giard? Yes. Councillor Nabari? Yes. Councillor Mayori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Sheriff? Yes. Okay. One last one, 20.012, an ordinance relative to demolition review for historically significant building. <laughs> Motion <coughs> has been made. Second. And seconded by Councilor Mayori. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Garrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes. Uh, I'm sorry. In second reading. Uh, move to adjourn, please. Second. Second. Okay, we're adjourning, please add. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.